for us to moderate this session. This session is enlightened with India's respected and learned speaker. The theme of our session is Echocardiographic Assessment of Different Valvular Heart Disease and Related Problems. Before going to start this session, I would like to introduce our honorable chairperson. Our honorable persons are Professor A. Nojir Islam, Professor A. K. M. Khosru Rahman, Dr. Shatish C. Gavin, Dr. Onurudha De, Dr. Monju Shahkut, Dr. Nikan Sabarwal, Dr. Reshim Borwa, Dr. Fegola Soji, and Dr. Karsimir Ristova. Our respected panelists are Professor M. Shahbuddin Khan, Professor Amindi Raushanali, Professor Mubar Shekhari, Dr. Abdul Khalid, Dr. Mohnuti, Dr. Abdul Ali, Dr. M. Khushid Ahmed, Dr. M. Seni Mahu, and Dr. Shaila Nasir. Now I'd like to start this. Dilara. Dilara. Call the, call the first speaker. Okay. Our first speaker is Shatish Tegavin. He is Chief Non-Invasive Cardiology, Cardiologist Nayan Institute for Cardiac Science, in NHL City. Uh, uh, he will uh, talk about the echocardiographic assessment of the mitral valve. Dr. C. Gobind, please welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, so the mitral valve has got a long history. It is uh, the valve which sort of set the motion as far as echo is concerned. So it's got a lot of background behind it. It's a broad topic. So I'll focus on some basic and some uh, uh, key areas. Let's look at the valve itself. Uh, when you look at the valve, it is a complex or an apparatus as it is described. So it has the annulus, leaflets, you have the cordae, the papillary muscle, the left ventricle, and the left atrium also, since they are uh, also involved in uh, mechanisms which can lead to problems. So they are also sort of indirectly uh, part of the apparatus. Now, uh, a few important uh, points as far as the valve is concerned in terms of anatomy. So one needs to know that there is uh, something like a fibrous skeleton of the heart. So this is dense connective tissue which sort of wraps itself around all the four valves. Uh, but when it comes to the mitral valve, it is the thickest uh, because it is the left ventricle which it has to support. Uh, this is something which one has to be aware. So this prevents overstretching stretching of the valves and also acts as an electrical uh, sort of a barrier between the atria and the ventricles. The next important anatomical uh, point which uh, one has to keep in mind is that there is something called as a central fibrous body here. So here you have the AV node and you also have a little bit of the uh, interventricular septum which sort of peeps around here and then you have the right trigone. So this forms a crucial area, especially for the operating surgeon. So any pathology which is involving this area, uh, one needs to highlight this in the report. Then the actual specimen. So this is something which we are all familiar. So just going through this. So you have the mitral valve and then you can look at the cordae here and then the papillary muscle. So it looks so different from what we see on the 2D and the 3D. Uh, let's go a little inside the mitral valve. So this is from the left atrial side. You have the uh, mitral annulus, which circles around the, uh, the valve. And then from the mitral annulus, you have the anterior mitral leaflet and the posterior mitral leaflet. And what is very obvious is that this has got a large area, but uh, less of connection to the annulus. So it is more mobile. While this has got more attachment and less area, so it is less mobile here. And then you have these small indentations, uh, which are the scallops, uh, which the anterior mitral leaflet does not have. If you go to the LV side, you look at the uh, cordae very clearly here fine, thin cordae, so, uh, and then you have the papillary muscles. Then uh, just one last look at the anatomy. So the important uh, anatomy, which uh, uh, an area which one again has to note is that there is something called as the intervalvular fibrosa between the aortic valve and the uh, mitral valve, specifically the anti-mitral leaflet. So this is also called as the aortomitral curtain. And this is where a lot of pathologies happen. And the trigones 
as you can see, this is how it looks like. So now that we know the anatomy, uh, let us look at the approach. So the approach is uh, uh, to answer these questions. So taking a table from the European uh, guidelines of uh, 2017. So if one has to look at uh, the valvular heart disease, uh, there are a lot of questions uh, which has to be answered. So from the echo point of view, we can look at how severe is it? What is the etiology to some extent? And uh, we can also correlate symptoms in terms of severity. And also we can uh, look at how we can uh, associate and, uh, in, in terms of prognosis, in terms of intervention, in terms of uh, especially asymptomatic patients. And also uh, looking to see what type of uh, surgery, what type of intervention can be planned. So this is how the echo uh, can be helpful in terms of mitral valve. Now, there are uh, three possible ways to assess the mitral valve. So one is by transthoracic echo, the other one is the transesophageal echo, and the less uh, uh, trodden path is the stress echo. The transthoracic echo is a class one indication, and uh, it is primarily to look at the etiology, severity, the hemodynamics, the prognosis, the timing. So this is in the early phase, in the initial phase. Then again, if one has to repeat echo, uh -huh. it is in terms of... Uh, looking at when there is a change in symptoms of physical examination or uh, in periodic monitoring of patients with this again as per the guidelines. T is in uh, certain scenarios like especially if you have a mitral stenosis and uh, one is uh, looking at an intervention, looking at thrombus, suspicion of infective endocarditis where the transthoracic echo is not contributing and then you looking at mechanism for the valve dysfunction which again TT is not providing and then again to uh, guide and monitor interventions. Uh, as far as exercise testing, it's very niche areas. So very still the data is sort of unfolding, but it's coming more and more into prominence. Uh, I have limited experience in this, uh, but there are some institutes doing a lot of exercise testing. So again, this is to look at uh, uh, symptoms and its mismatch, look at hemodynamics and mismatch, and also to determine prognosis. So this is where exercise testing is concerned. It can be both uh, exercise echo, which is preferable, and in some areas where uh, dobutamine also can play a role. Now let us look at the methods. So methods-wise, there is the M-mode echo, you have the 2D echo, and then you have the Doppler. So this is the, the mainstay, the backbone of uh, routine echo as far as mitral valve is concerned. So we have now 3D, which is playing a big role. Strain, which is sort of um, mentioned, but still has a limited role. M mode primarily has got limited value only in certain scenarios. And uh, these waveforms generally tell us some sort of an abnormality uh, in terms of how the filling is happening in terms of any pathologies. So primarily it uh, reflects the phasic nature of the LV filling, but limited value. Then you have the 2D echo. So here again, it is uh, very crucial, but it is uh, window dependent. So good windows gives you good information. If not, you have to look at other modalities. And uh, what information does it give? It, it gives you st uh, structural information in terms of the mitral valve apparatus and the chambers. Next is the Doppler, again, very, very crucial. So Doppler can be divided into color flow and then spectral. So it looks at flow abnormalities. It gives us uh, spatial information in terms of uh, the jet itself, presence or absence, and then multiple jets, in what direction it is going. So that is the advantage of color flow, while the spectral Doppler provides us information about the gradients, velocity, pressure uptime, and uh, so on, and uh, many other parameters. So that's where the spectral Doppler provides us. 3D echo has been very, very sort of, uh, 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 sort of a, been a game changer as far as uh, T is concerned. It uh, gives you better spatial understanding of the anatomy, better understanding of anatomy. It has its own disadvantages, has its own sort of limitations, but to a large extent, it can be very, very helpful, especially when it comes to T. It can also give you good functional information in, in terms of the LV function. But what is important is that it is dependent on 2D images. So good 2D images provides good uh, 3D images. Strain, there is, uh, the, the data are uh, uh, sort of continuing to come. Again, limited utility, but gives us information in terms of functional information. So this is an example of uh, uh, an, a severe mitral regurgitation. And uh, this is a document from the, uh, the ESCBI and where they say that it is reasonable to do it. And where they say it is, is in terms of asymptomatic patients and severe primary MR, where there is borderline values when you have 60 to 65 decision making, also borderline LV end a systolic diameter in terms of uh, regurgitation, in terms of decision making. Now, look at the views. So these are regular views, which are all familiar. 
Uh, beyond this, the, uh, the key sort of point is not just look at the uh, traditional views, one has to go uh, and look at the off-axis views also. So one has to sort of adapt and be flexible if a particular view is not forthcoming. So one has to so go a little away from it and try to get the uh, off-axis views and uh, where we can uh, get some additional information. So the mitral valve especially is a very, very eco-friendly valve. And that is why you get some excellent images. And uh, these are the standard uh, areas, uh, the views which you see it. Now, uh, I'm switching to T. So these images are uh, intuitive. So they're uh, almost like the transthoracic. So let's uh, sort of look at how we can piece the anatomy here. So let's take the annulus first. So you have these terminologies. So depending on which view it is, it is the medial lateral annulus. And then again, in this three chamber, it is a posterior annulus. And then the inferior, you can look at the inferior anterior annulus. So the annulus can be sort of localized. And then one can look at the annular plane in terms of measuring the annulus uh, in terms of sizing it or to look at any mitral valve prolapse or for other reasons uh, in terms of uh, uh, various measurements that are now to be done in terms of mitral valve repair. So the annular plane is something which is very important. Then the leaflet itself, if you are going to write an echo report and if you are going to be very specific, we have to be very, very careful in how we write it. So you have the atrial side of the leaflet and you have the ventricular side, and then you have the margin, the mid leaflet, the base. So this is how we can localize it. Then we can look at leaflet segments. So this itself is quite extensive. So I'll just sort of uh, go through it very quickly. So again, in the fourth chamber, you have the uh, segments two, which are sort of common to both the anterior uh, uh, mitral leaflet and the PML. And then you have uh, the two chamber view, which gives us additional segments as far as AML is concerned, where AML is more prominently seen. And then the all important commissural view. So this is where you get to see the commissures, especially when you have an obstructed lesion of the mitral valve, where the, uh, looking at the commissures is very, very important. And uh, this is the anterolateral commissure, uh, which is towards this side. And then you have the postromedial uh, again, away from the appendage here. And then uh, this is typically the long axis uh, view. So the uh, segments, uh, the A2 and P2 segments are seen here. So there are many variations which I'll not go into. Now, look, coming to the subvalvular apparatus. So we have to be a little more sort of, uh, you know, uh, more uh, detailed here. So let's look at the antimitral leaflet here. So the antimitral leaflet, uh, if you look at it closely, has uh, uh, cordae which comes and attaches here. So this is to the margin. So it is called as a marginal cordae. Then you have the cordae which attaches very few, not many, uh, what are called a struck cordae. So this attaches to the mid segment. But what is important is the base of the leaflet does not have any cordae, and this is the clear zone. So this is how the anatomy of the AML is uh, when it comes to the cordae. The PML, on the other hand, is cordae uh, inserted throughout the, uh, uh, the length of the leaflet. So you have the marginal cordae, you have the mid cordae, and then you have the basal cordae. So that is the difference as far as cordal attachments to the PML is concerned. Now let's look at the pathologies. We have the regurgitation here. So when we are looking at a regurgitant lesion, uh, it is important that we do a very systematic approach. So in terms of uh, we have to go through in a methodical way. So the first and foremost is, especially if it is uh, uh, an elective and you have time on your hand. So we have to start with the 2D. And this is something which uh, you have to go through, do a good 2D examination first, look for any structural changes, structural abnormalities, look at all the various parts of the mitral valve. So here is an example of a mitral valve prolapse, and then you have a vegetation here, a flail segment. So there are many things one can pick up here, and this uh, we can sort of uh, uh, associate and uh, correlate with the uh, color and the Doppler as we sort of proceed with the study. Now, a very important message as far as color flow uh, imaging uh, quantification is concerned, eyeballing and uh, trying to come to a severity is not accepted. So it is not there in the guidelines. And this is a study which very clearly shows that uh, uh, they have taken uh, six patients here, 12 uh, expert people, and they were all asked to see the same images uh, again without, they were blinded to it. And uh, the error ranges from 67% to do almost, I mean, to that's as high as, as you can get it here. So it's very important that we don't go by the color uh, image uh, uh, quantification in terms of severity. So avoid this. This is just uh, for an initial impression or in a acute situation where we can utilize this, but not in a routine situation. So how do we do this uh, in a more objective way? Uh, you have this uh, uh, time tested old method of jet area has its own limitations. So pluses and minus. So uh, be very careful. It is not very sensitive. Uh, you have these various uh, uh, sort of uh, 
uh, numbers here. So one is just to look at the jet area. Another one is to look at both the LA and the jet area and do a ratio to it and see how the numbers stack up. So not very reliable, but uh, so, uh, again, uh, recommended as far as the guideline is concerned. Next is looking at continuous wave Doppler. So just by looking at this, uh, the waveform itself gives you an idea. So it has got a broad sort of duration. It is parabolic. Uh, that is uh, the initial impression. And then you can see that it has got high velocity. So that is the other one. And the density itself tells you the more denser it is, more severe the, uh, the regurgitation. But again, it is very sort of uh, uh, not very reliable because you can increase the gain by uh, cranking up the knob and you can get into trouble. So not very reliable here, but you can use it. Then looking at the velocity and the shape itself, you can see that this is more V-shaped. It is of lower velocity. So this tells you that there is high LA pressure, severe MR. So these are sort of subtle points which you can uh, incorporate. Now, one can use the pulse wave Doppler. So the pulse wave Doppler, just looking at the E velocity. So the E velocity, if, it's, if it is in something like, if I can call it as a grade one diastolic uh, sort of a pattern, that means that the MR is not significant at all. So straight away, you know, you can clearly tell that this is not significant MR. But once the E velocity starts to increase in the height, uh, you can start to see that the regurgitation is going to be more and more significant. So this is moderate. And then you can, once it exceeds about 1.2, 1.3, some even take 1.5. So that means the uh, regurgitation is quite uh, severe. Then looking at the pulmonary veins. So the pulmonary veins, you have uh, the S wave, which is uh, taller than the D wave. And as the uh, severity increases, you start to see that the S starts to decrease in size. And at some point when it becomes severe, it reverses. So this is uh, decreased S, uh, S wave. So it is blunted here, moderate uh, MR. And here you can see that there is uh, actual reversal, complete reversal here. So this is severe MR. So looking at pulmonary veins. Then you have the regurgitant volume. So you can do it the traditional way. You can do it by the, uh, the, the PISA method. Uh, can be challenging. It is sort of mentioned in almost all criteria. It takes a little experience. Uh, and uh, just, uh, you know, you have to do, make sure that your technique is good if you're going to get an accurate uh, uh, number. The one which is sort of... Uh, probably would be the one which you should be using in a routine way is the Wiener contractor. It is reasonably objective and fairly simple and quite reliable and robust. Uh, just two views, both in the long axis as well as in the four chamber. And uh, just looking at it, you know, making sure that the technique is good, zoom it up and then uh, uh, you get these uh, fine measurements and use this and you get the, get the Wiener contractor. It cannot be used in certain scenarios, uh, but uh, that's how the technique is. Next is the uh, much hyped and much sort of talked about uh, PISA in terms of real life, not very great mixed results. So you need to have a good hemisphere, only then the PISA does well. So when the orifice is not uh, circular, then the PISA is not going to be reliable. So you have to be careful in terms of what anatomy you're dealing with. And if you feel that uh, this is an anatomy where the orifice is less likely to be circular and more likely to be oval or elliptical, your uh, PISA will not work and it can vary uh, also. So just keep this in mind. It is a little time consuming, but again, this is part of the guidelines and uh, this is how it is. So uh, beyond this, we have the 3D echo. One can look at the valve pathology better in terms of uh, chamber volumes. It can be quite useful. And uh, also to look at the effective uh, reg uh, regurgitated orifice area still yet to come uh, in terms of the, uh, the piece of the 3D. Chambers, uh, we have to make sure that both the upstream downstream changes are analyzed in terms of its size, in terms of its function. And very importantly, what is the uh, effect of other valves which are there, which is uh, maybe causing some uh, impact on the various parameters. So one needs to factor that. And the all important PA pressure is something which has to be done before you conclude it. Now, the other area where echo is useful in terms of uh, regurgitation is in terms of interventions. So these interventions are very limited in terms of uh, the way it is done in uh, the Asia. It is uh, still uh, not come in a big way, uh, but it can be very, very helpful, highly dependent as far as the intervention is concerned. The echo is something which uh, is the eyes for the uh, interventionist. So this is something where it can play a big role. Then you have this carpentier classification, fairly simple, fairly straightforward. So uh, in terms of especially mitral regurgitation, you have the type one leaflet where you have a normal leaflet. And uh, this is where the annulus dilates, but the leaflets are normal. So you need to sort of uh, keep this in mind. And then you have the type two where you have the excessive mobility. Excessive mobility is nothing but prolapsing uh, when you have the flail leaflet also. 
Uh, and then you have the third one is the restricted mobility. Restricted mobility can be both in systole and diastole. And this is uh, in rheumatic heart disease. This is where we are most familiar. And the one where systole is uh, uh, the cause for the restriction, this is in the ischemic heart disease, the tethered PML. So this is the carpentier classification. So just a brief look at some pathologies here. So you have the mitral valve prolapse where how 3D sort of provides you some very uh, crucial and uh, precise information in terms of segments which are involved. And then again, uh, uh, echo useful in terms of uh, acute MR situations. Uh, that's another scenario altogether because of lack of time, not go into it. And then this is a, a case of ischemic cardiomyopathy. Now, let me go into the stenosis part of it. So this is the other area. In stenosis, it's important that when we look at any uh, valve, which we look at possibly stenotic, we have to look at the mobility and uh, look at the thickness. The more the thickness, the more thickened the valve it is, the more it is towards the annulus. That means it's not a good valve. More calcification, again, obviously not good. And then the subvalve also, as you can see here, a lot of calcification and in, in involving the subvalve. So we have to be very careful. Not easy subvalve, uh, but uh, you need to look at uh, views in terms of the uh, long axis and then a little bit of off axis, foreshortening and uh, going off axis in the fourth chamber also. Opening of the valve is best seen, uh, especially in the short axis. Uh, especially to look at the commissures, look at the calcification, which was not seen in the other views in a sort of on fast way. And then the uh, M mode in one of the few scenarios where it can be helpful. So if you see the PML going towards the AML, that is a paradoxical moment. Uh, so that is very classical and very sort of striking as far as RHD is concerned, where there's commercial fusion. So this is uh, one of the few areas where uh, M mode is useful. And then how do we sort of uh, quantify it? So in terms of planimetry, you can go for a straightforward uh, uh, planimetry in terms of 2D and then uh, look at uh, the valve uh, has problems. Uh, can it give you problems when there is calcification, can give, cause shadowing. And again, the commissures may not be in the same plane, so it can get vary. So, so the valve area can vary here. So a better approach is if you have a 3D probe, you can uh, just go for a biplane or an X-plane and then uh, you can make sure that you cut it at the exact moment and you can get your uh, valve orifices very precise and uh, very accurate. Then you have the all important and all familiar gradients. So gradients are Doppler and then they are sort of uh, influenced by hemodynamics so that we have to be very careful. So the, the, the gradients are important, but uh, if we have to make sure that we don't sort of uh, over depend on to correlate with other uh, parameters also. And then you have the mitral valve area, the pressure half time uh, uh, using this uh, method has its own limitations, uh, but this is again another routinely used technique and uh, this uh, can also be used. Then the less used and uh, possibly more of theoretical, uh, I have never used, uh, frankly speaking here, the continuity equation, and then you have the PISA. So uh, this is just for the sake of including it, I'm sort of including it. And then you have the mitral leaflet separation index. To some extent, it works. So just by a simple measurement in the zoom view, both in the long axis and in the uh, four chamber view. So just the distance between this uh, tells us uh, it's a very specific test, not very sensitive. So it can tell you that whether it is severe or uh, uh, it is mild. And uh, this is useful, especially in quick uh, scenarios or where your other parameters are ambiguous. So again, in terms of looking at stenosis, you look at the 3D uh, where it can give you information in terms of the commissures where the 2D can be a bit of a problem. Complex asymmetry of the orifices, 3D can be helpful. Uh, that is where the real sort of value is. And then you have the chambers uh, in terms of assessment and especially to look at the LA thrombus, the T would be very useful. And again, just like the uh, leaky valve, uh, the other valves uh, impact also should be considered and the PA pressure as always is very important. So uh, like interventions here, you can see that it is uh, very important as far as uh, the uh, mitral stenosis is concerned post uh, PTMC. This is a scenario where you can see that it can uh, tell us uh, problems uh, in, uh, in terms of complications, in terms of success, in terms of guiding uh, the interventionists. So this is where it is useful. So coming to the last few slides, uh, again, uh, uh, obstruction stenosis. You have the congenital example here, and then you have the older age where you have the annulus which calcifies and can cause uh, stenosis in a very small minority, but it is always there, which we have to sort of uh, know about it. And then you have this uh, so-called the pseudo uh, sort of mitral stenosis, uh, which sort of uh, the large myxoma uh, echo can be very useful here. And you can see that it mimics the mitral stenosis. And uh, this again can be very valuable in trying to find out what is the pathology causing the mitral inflow obstruction here. 
So in conclusion, uh, mitral valve is something which is very eco-friendly compared to a lot of other valves. It is very important that you go through a very methodical way, especially when you have uh, an elective echo and uh, make sure that you go through the sequence so that without missing and make sure that the, the multiple parameters are taken into account. And the co combination of these parameters uh, tells you in which direction your uh, stenosis, your uh, severity is going. And uh, whenever you have ambiguous or you need incremental information, definitely look at T, 3D and of course, uh, additional other multimodality imaging uh, options are there. So uh, to my last line would be is very useful in trying to look at the diagnosis and detecting the abnormality. And it can be very useful in terms of procedural planning and also to monitor these patients post-procedure or even as they sort of progress and you want to keep looking at the patients for long-term monitoring. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shatish Gobin, uh, for your dice and organized, organized presentation. Now, I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Aniruddha De uh, from Kolkata, to give his presentation in the topic of echocardiographic evaluation uh, of tricuspid valve. Dr. Aniruddha De is a consultant, Department of Non Invasive Cardiology in Apollo Hospital, Kolkata. Sir, please. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I'm just sharing my screen. Just a minute. Is it visible? My screen is visible? Yes, sir. You are visible. Yeah. And am I audible also? Yes, sir. Yeah. So after a very lucid demonstration by Dr. Satis, of mitral valve, uh, I'll go into the tricuspid valve and imaging of the tricuspid valve by echo is difficult. Why? Because there is a lot of literature, a lot of textbook is telling the certain things, but no one is conclusive. Second cause is that the majority of the time we do echo is spent on the mitral valve. Only 20% time is only spent on the tricuspid valve. That's why it has not developed so far. Anyway, normal tricuspid valve function depends on the interaction between the fibrous annulus, leaflet, papillary muscle, cord tendony, adjacent right atrial and right ventricular myocardium. So any congenital acquired disorder of these individual component of the tricuspid valve complex will result in valve incompetence or stenosis. The tricuspid valve anatomy shows a greater variability than the anatomy of the mitral valve. Starting from the, we start from the M mode, we start from the 2D and then to the 3D. But still, the tricuspid valve is, a, 3D is always the aided value in the tricuspid valve in the tuna more than in 85% of patients. Now, begin with the anatomy. There is a three leaflet usually. There's anterior, septal, and the posterior. There is a fibrous annulus, caudate tendony, papillary muscle, RA myocardium, and RV myocardium. Now, if you do the cross section of the tricuspid valve is located ablock obliquely behind the aortic valve, which is absolutely at the center. The pulmonary valve is positioned anterior and superior and slightly to the left of the aortic valve. But how many leaflet does the tricuspid valve actually have? The valve consists usually of three leaflet named after their position. That is the anterior, posterior or the septum. And if you can see the unfast view, then you can able to identify this is the posterior, this is the septal, and this is the anterior. And the normal valve area is 4 to 6 square centimeter. Anterior leaflet is also called anterior superior, is the largest leaflet. And second largest is the septal. And the posterior leaflet is inferior or the marginal, and the most frequently the smallest of them, and often of scallops of the posterior valve. But really, you can find out certain accessory leaflets, and they have been described. There is a 30 it leaflet vary from three to seven. And these extra leaflets are called accessory leaflets. Accessory leaflets are very common in tricuspid valve. Coming to the subvalvular apparatus, now is the variability of the papillary muscle is a normal characteristics of the tricuspid valve. Number is varied from two to nine, but usually two to three papillary muscle can be seen or discerned in the echocardiography. The anterior, which is the most prominent and which is often bifid or trifid, and septal papillary muscle is the least prominent 
and sometimes even may be absent. This papillary muscle, you can see, in the are connected by the moderator band, which can be best seen in the apical fourth chamber view. You can see in the fourth chamber view, and this is a normal anatomical structure. And the septomarginal trabecula carrying the part of the right bundle of the conduction system to the anterior papillary muscle should not be confused with the right ventricular mass. So this is very important. So any tethering of the tricuspid valve causing the dilatation of the tricuspid annulus and both congenital and the acquired tethering of the tricuspid valve niblet will result in impaired mobility, incomplete cooperation, and the apical displacement of the regurgitant jet origin. Now, while echocardiogram, the first view is the best, but what are the three more, four more, most four more important view we do practice is the parasternal right ventricular inflow view, parasternal sword axis view, apical four chamber view, and the subcostal view. The leaflet ID should be ideally be done from the infas view of the valve. And that can be done only by the three dimensional echocardiography or only in transthoracic echocardiography by two dimensional echocardiography from this modified subcostal view and only the ventricular perspective. So, in a nutshell, if you do the basal sort axis view, you can either see the posterior anterior leaflet here in the anterior or septal leaflet. Nothing is fixed. If you do a ch change, little change of angulation, it could be either anterior or septal, or it could be either anterior or posterior, because there are the three leaflets. Now, in the right, right ventricular inflow view, you will get the septal leaflet or the posterior leaflet. And same thing in the apical view, either you get the septal leaflet here and the anterior and the posterior leaflet by 2D or by 3D. So, TT examination uses mainly the four imaging window that I have already described, but none of these windows can image all the TV light leaflets of the tricuspid valve simultaneously. The transthoracic 2D, transthoracic 3D, and the trans uh, esophageal 3D, you will find there is a definite dissonation of the tricuspid valve very clearly. So this is a 2D pictures. You can see that this is tricuspid valve, you can see. Here is the, you can see, the transthoracic 3D and this is the transesophageal 3D. Of course, the transesophageal 3D will give the better pictures in this. So, if you want to do the NFAS view, this is the ventricular view. You can see the tricuspid valve, anterior, posterior, and the septal. This is the anterior, and this is the posterior, and this is the septal. And this is the atrial view where you can see this is the anterior, this is the posterior, and the septal. And this view is most important in the NFAS view in the pre-evaluation of the tricuspid valve. Of course, if you do the longitudinal cartoons of the data set, allow the assessment of the even the leaflet motion and the anatomy of the subvalvular vertex, where you can see the cordy clearly with anterior papillary motions and the moderator band. Certain things if you can even the 3D, you can very clearly see. See, this is the septal, first one is the septal prolapse. Here you can see the vegetation in the infective endocarditis. Here you can see the tricuspid valve prolapse. And here you can see the entangled of the pacing wear within the tricuspid valve. Here also you can see the large vegetation in the posterior leaflet. You can see the large vegetation in the posterior leaflet. Here is, you can see the tricuspid valve orifice is totally fixed, as you see in the carcinoid. And this is, there is a thickened tricuspid valve with the tricuspid stenosis as we see in the rheumatic. And this is a prosthetic tricuspid valve with multiple vegetation. So these are the things you can see in the 3D. Of course, you can be advanced 3D printing where you can give a, a clear image of the tricuspid valve to a surgeon also. This thing is called. So the role of TT is important. What is the important role of TT in assessing the severity of the tear? And the right ventricular systolic pressure as the images are obtained in a conscious patient with the normal resting hemodynamics. So baseline TT studies should also use to elucidate the etiology of the tear, measure the size of the right-sided chambers and the IVC and assess the RV systolic function and characterize any associated left-sided disease. So a technically adequate and complete TT examination may be difficult to perform in such patients as we know in the COPD and and then the post-cardiac surgery patient. So those are the patients we have to resort to the transesophageal view. 
There are the four more, more important views in the mediosophageal level. Either it is the mediosophageal fourth chamber view, where you can guess same thing, or the mediosophageal right intro view, or mediosophageal modified bicable view, where you get the anterior and the posterior, or is the transgastric short axis view, and the right, transgastric right basal view, or the deep transgastric right ventricular view to get the proper anatomy of the tricuspid valve. So this is a routine view of the tri transesophageal echo. You can see the anatomy and the tricuspid regurgitation very fairly. Now, after delineating the anatomy, this most important is the mechanism of the tricuspid regurgitation. This is the primary or secondary. See, see the secondary or the functional tear where the TV annular dilatation, RV dilatation, or the papillary muscle dysplasia, where valve is absolutely normal, is absolutely called 80 to 85 percent of patients. Whereas the primary or organic tear is constitute 15 to 30 percent patient is the intrinsic abnormality of the valve apotus. So if you take the 70 to 80 percent of the functional tear, the commonest cause are chronic P, RV ischemia, left-sided valve disease, atrial fibrillation, or left right sun. Now, when you evaluate the tricuspid valve, one thing is very important to recognize that tricuspid valve is a saddle shaped structure where there is a Saddle shape structure where there is a high points of these are the area and these are the low points. So normal, this has to be, I'll show you in the 3D picture in the greater way. So normal tricuspid valve diameter in adult is 28 plus minus 5 millimeter. And the significant tricuspid annular dilatation is defined by a diastolic diameter of more than 21 millimeter per square meter or more than 35 when somebody is telling more than 40. So this is actually the saddle slip structure. And you can see the superior point and the inferior point. The low points are high points. And this is of ellipsoid set. Now, what is the importance of the tricuspid annulus? Because this is very, very important. If you know this ticker, is if you do the MB repair only an MB repair with the TB repair, you can find the grade 3 to grade 4 tear persists in 34% of patients. If you will, and mortality is high. And if you do the MB and TB repair, mortality is very low. Sword measurement of the tricuspid only performed using the 2D echocardiography. Yes, TSI measured during 2D echocardiography should be interpreted with caution because it is underestimated by 2D TE or 3D TE. So you should measure and it should be substantiated by either by TE or by 3D. That's why is the role for 3D echocardiography. No, there is a better approximation of the septal and the lateral dimension and allows measurement of the also the anterior posterior dimension. And if you do that short axis dimension, then the long axis dimension, also the RV focus dimension, and it will give a clear idea of the tricuspid annulus in the printing also. Now, what are the pathology involving the TB? TB can be affected by many conditions where they, I already told you there is maybe primary degradation. These include the rheumatic, myxomatous, or carcinoid disease. Even in Epstein anomaly, is pacemaker dependent and or any device wear dependent. And functional tear is by far the most prevalent in the include 75% of patients. And it is the cause of these, you know, the left heart disease in pulmonary, particularly resulting in pulmonary hypertension or the other cause of pulmonary hypertension, then myocardial disease, pulmonary embolism, even the atrial fibrillation with the, with the dilatation of the right atrial can give rise to when the functional tear encountered during cardiac surgery is that due to valve disease and dysfunction of the left side of the heart. Small degree of tear is common and that is usually central and a thin central jet. See, here is the basic difference. So when you evaluate the mitral valve and the tricuspid valve, these valves is a different valve orifice, different subvalvular apparatus and the different ventricle. But here TR and MR are, we are assess, assessing in the similar ways. And that's why there is a paradox. So the functional tear is a tricuspid annular dilatation may be a more reliable indicator of TB pathology than tricuspid regurgitation. So whenever you assess the tricuspid valve, tricuspid annulus is a must, must, and must. Whether it is a mild or moderate regurgitation, is a moderate or severe regurgitation, is less important than tricuspid annulation because there is a good correlation between the tricuspid annular diameter and the T regurgitant value. The annulus is dilated if it measures more than 40 millimeter or 21 millimeter per square meter in transthoracic echocardiography or in the surgeons usually do if they measure 
intraoperatively if it is more than 70 mm. So, relevant abnormality of the tricuspid tri 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 valve is that one is annulus diameter, then is the coaptation height, that is the tenting, that is, if it is more than 8 mm, then RV abnormality of the RV, that is the RV endastolic area, more than 20 square centimeter, or the eccentricity index more than 2. And you do the RV dysfunction either by TAPSI or the systolic peak of the uh, tissue velocity. But one thing is very important is that the tricuspid degree, when the T dilates, tricuspid and blood, it, it mostly along the RV free wall. Safe term portion of the tricuspid is relatively fixed. Another important thing is that when you measure the tricuspid annulus, you have to take the inspiratory variability. So if you took the variability is near about 4 millimeter between the inspiration and expiration. So you must take the average of that. And when the tricuspid blood dilates, it flattened, not like in a saddle set. So when it takes dapple, it worsening tear, the annulus become larger, rounder and flatter and giving rise to tenting. So you must measure the annular dilatation and the tethering of the tenting. This tenting can indicate severity of the valve means function. If you see tenting height is 3.3 millimeter gives rise to mild tear, here you see tenting height is 8.8, .8, though the annulus area is same. So mechanism of tricuspid means tear is a highly dependent on annular dilatation with significant tear occurring only in 40% of the dilatation. Whereas it is in 75% dilatation in case of mitral valve studies. That is, TB leaks earlier than the mitral valve. Now, grading of the tricuspid valve, we already know, but two important points I must highlight. This is the most important one that is the ERA. If it is less than 0.2, it is mild, it is more than 0.4, it is severe, in between, it is the moderate. And R regurgitant volume, if it is less than 30, is mild, more than 50 is severe, moderate is 30 to 44. So this is, I can show you, this is a mild regurgitation and you can find out this is a moderate tricuspid regurgitation and this is a severe tricuspid regurgitation. So this is a, the people view. There is a guidelines where you TA dilated is more than 40 millimeter in apical port chamber view. You have to do something. There is a guidelines is there. So this seat I'm topping. The mechanism of tricuspid e regurgitation, where there is a functional tricuspid regurgitation, you measure all these parameters. So, uh, um, the sort of time. One thing is that if you can 3D even, you can measure the TV tenting volume. If tenting volume, you can measure the tenting volume that can be proper uh, for the evaluation. So, what is the new direction is the evaluation of the um, functional tier is a more compared approach. This. So TR severity is the annular diameter and the leaflet cooptation mode. See, in mild case, it is normal, whereas in the moderate case, it is age to age. And in stage 3, in the severe tear, it is absence, that is the leaflet cooptation mode. And for that, the treatment depends. Now, in the iatrogenic tricuspid regression, there is the ever-increasing prevalence of device places across the TV, such as pacemaker or defibrillator wires, can result in a degree of iatrogenic tear. And the relative complication are infective endocarditis. And these can happen when, after the patient that can worsen the tear in observing the post CBD. See, this is an ICD inside an echo. There is a nothing, there is a very little tear. And after eight days, you can post ICD, you can see the severe tear. And there is a pacemaker dependent tear also, also because of the lead improvement. So this is a pacemaker lead adherence, and there is a severe tear. And you can see is that there is a pacemaker lead is impacted in the tricuspid valve and there is a severe tear. And this another thing after tear is a tricuspid stenosis. As the TB is the largest of the cardiac valve, significant TS is uncommon. Causes include rheumatoid and carcinoid heart disease. In addition, there is certain congenital heart disease like congenital tricuspid steno a congenital stenosis or Epstein anomaly, tricuspid atresia and other atrioventricular anomalies are also there. When you call this a significant tricuspid stenosis, see, you see qualitative, the right atrium is enlarged, severely enlarged, IVC is dilated and the mean pressure gradient is more than 5 millimeter of mercury with a pH of less than 190 and the valve area is less than 1. So I'll give an example, 25 year old lady, this is a rheumatic mitral stenosis. 
you can see with a moderate regurgitation. But if you see it very clearly, there is a tricuspid valve, there is a moderate regurgitation, and there is a flow convergence in the tricuspid area. And now you see, this is, if you see the tricuspid valve is also... Sir, only two minutes left, sir. Okay, okay. I just pass to the within two minutes. So you can see this, the, uh, the, the tricuspid stenosis is the gradient of about 7 mmHg. So it's a basically a rheumatic mitral and tricuspid valve venosis. Here is a one-year-old female infant, is a cyanosed baby. You can find out that there is a severe tricuspid stenosis and regurgitation. You can see the gradient of about near about 14 mmHg in a one-year-old boy. And there is a severe regurgitation. And in addition, there is also severe pulmonary stenosis. So it's a congenital, sorry, it's a congenital a combined tricuspid and pulmonary valve stenosis with moderate tricuspid regurgitation. Another one-year-old baby presenting with the cyanosis, you can say this is a classical tricuspid atresia, where there is a, there is a VSD, where there is nothing, no, no flow is going into the... What to say? This is a case of really classical carcinoid disease, where you can see this tricuspid valve is totally fixed and is not opening and closing at all. And you can see there is a nothing is flowing at all. And there is a severe tear. And in another important part of the tricuspid valve has to be certain is located slightly, is slightly closer to the apex. And if you measure this tricuspid valve attachment. And Excuse the me, sir. Sir, two minutes left. So please start wrapping up. Okay. So it, uh, so um, within two minutes, I'll finish. So one minute I'll take. So that, there is a eight millimeter different, more than eight, there is an Epstein. So I'll show you in a rapid sound. This is a classical Epstein. And we can see the cooptation failure is here. And here is a, another curl with a non-compaction of the LV with the, with the Epstein. And this is a 14-year-old girl. Again, there is a Epstein with rhabdomyoma. And there is an and another case of Epstein's with accessory mitral valve tissue. There is a very, very rare entity with a, yeah. And last case is the blonde chest trauma, where you can see the it is a this is a young boy had a history of injury five years back. And now they've come to the symptomatic with a severe air valves, totally air valves. You can see the tricuspid valve from the papillary muscle. And same thing you can see in the 3D. And completely have us in the place. And lastly, the endocarditis, you can see the lead endocarditis are not out of this there. And so these are the different, this is a classical patient of the lead endocarditis, which was treated by a medical management capsophagin. And this patient is improved. And that's why we saw the case. And this lead where is nothing is there. So summarize this tricuspid valve function is a complex and depends on the size and function of the RV, RA, papillary muscle, leaflets, and cordy. Echocardiography is the method of choice to assess the TV function. Grading of the TV dysfunction is difficult due to a lack of reproducible parameters and reliable normal values. Assessment of TV function must therefore integrate all available clinical, technical information. Thank you. Dilaran, unmute, please. Unmute, Koro. Unmute. Dilaran, unmute, please. Thank you, sir, for your excellent and brilliant presentation. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Monju Shakur. Uh, he is cardiologist and clinical lecturer, Faculty of Medicine, Imperial College, London. Uh, Dr. Monji Shakur, please share your screen. Upload my file. No, sir.
Okay. I'm just trying to upload my slide just one second. Your screen is not visible. Sir, please share screen button, please, sir. Yeah, I'm just trying to do that. Okay, sir. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry for the delay. Yes, Manjur, go ahead. Yeah, can you see my? Can, yes. can you? See, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's okay now. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, very good uh, afternoon from people uh, watching this uh, talk in London and good evening to cardiologists in Bangladesh. And many thanks, uh, Professor Shajol Banerjee, who is my teacher and is a convener for this, and Professor uh, Nazrul Islam sir and Professor uh, Fazlur Rahman sir. And Shail Anabi is, is actually the moderator for this program. We studied in the same medical uh, college in Bangladesh. And COVID-19 coronavirus has distanced us socially but COVID-19 couldn't uh, distance our uh, uh, professionally. Uh, we are actually far closer in professionally when COVID has started. And I do not have any conflict of interest with this talk. And let us start, this is a, a small study, an European study around 5,000 patients and distribution of valvular heart disease in the Euro heart study. I think probably you can see the reference in, it, it was published in, back in 2003 European Heart Journal. But what you can see here, then uh, around 34% uh, uh, patient actually presented uh, aortic stenosis, around 10% patient is okay. active uh, valve disease, 10% with uh, aortic regurgitation, and mitral stenosis is not very common, and MR and AS is these two biggest uh, challenge in European countries. And so, Let's focus on what are the common causes sir. when you see a patient in uh, aortic uh, valve, you know, uh, yeah. sir. for you... aortic regurgitation, the common uh, common uh, um, mm -hmm. way I have is split it in uh, two portions. One is uh, it's a valvular problem, is problem with the valve itself. You can see bicuspid valve, this very common in uh, Western world. And rheumatic uh, valve disease, we don't see very common rheumatic valve disease. I think probably it is more prevalent in uh, Indian subcontinent, Bangladesh. Uh, and we see uh, degenerative uh, heart valve, aortic regurgitation is uh, much common than rheumatic disease. Then endocarditis, we, we see is more commonly in and acute causes. If you look at the images here, that uh, one in and it's a tricuspid calcified aortic valve. On the right, it is a bicuspid aortic valve. And, and classified by caspidal aortic valve. And this is a, a rheumatic aortic valve. And uh, bottom, uh, this one is, is somebody has got uh, perforation is because of infection and because of infective endocarditis. If we look at uh, the other reasons the why we see aortic uh, regards in our hospital, there is a problem with aortic root. It could be dissection. It's because of hypertension, high blood pressure and myofans. And if you look at this one, this is our glass shape. This is somebody who has got mouth and uh, uh, syndrome and presented in hospital with aortic regurgitation. So what happened? And this is because of the heart valve, that valve makes the heart sick. So, so this is actually out. So this is a primary cause. And if you see the other group, aortic group dilatation, that other causes that make the valve sick, so we commonly see aortic regards, one group because of the heart valve problem itself, and other group is because of the other causes causing valve uh, giving pressure. Let's refresh European uh, Society of Cardiology guideline published back in 2017. And what's new in this guideline? What they have uh, suggested to use of transesophageal echocardiography to evaluate the results of surgical and percutaneous interventions because percutaneous interventions are gradually, gradually become more uh, um, <clears throat> uh, 
and more in practice. And mm. all suggestions that CFR is considered useful when echocardiographic studies are not uh, optimal, especially volume. And also uh, suggested the MDCT with ECG synchronization when surgery is proposed. And what is the questionable aspect of that uh, guidance published back in 2016? And that criteria for aortic valve repair or replacement poorly defined. I think the, when the working group are sitting next time, I think probably they will be focusing on more because aortic valve repair gradually become popular. Uh, the committee will need to think more. Uh, update with new guideline. So uh, let's talk about the American Society of Echo guideline. And if you see the American Society, that's also published in back in 2017. Uh, what is new there? And actually, they have emphasis on etiology and mechanism of aortic regurgitation. During my talk, I slightly talk about oh, a couple of slides for a mechanism of uh, aortic regurgitation, and also is actually integrated approach of 2D and 3D trans prosthetic echo and also uh, transesophageal echo where it's needed. And also that guideline um, emphasis on uh, CMR. So just before going to any kind of images, let's uh, refresh our knowledge and what is European Society of Cardiology uh, guideline about the management of aortic regurgitation. You might ask me, Manju, why you have put this uh, slide before showing any kind of images or any echo. But uh, the reason I put this slide at the very beginning, because when you start assessing valve, at the end of the day, your focus would be like, who are the patient of mild AR, who has got moderate, who has got severe, and who need actually urgent uh, surgery. So if you look at this slide, significant enlargement of ascending aorta, and it is a uh, uh, indication, class one indication for surgery. And now look at that, somebody that don't have a significant ascending aorta, uh, but severe aortic regurgitation, if that patient is symptomatic, as again uh, fall into class one uh, surgical indication. If somebody ha doesn't have symptoms, and, 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 and these are the most challenging group, and uh, what you see actually, uh, left ventricular ejection fraction is less than 50%, and LV, uh, left ventricular end diastolic diameter of 70 millimeter or more, or LV, uh, and systolic diameter of 50 or more, and millimeter or more, and um, um, a, a body surface area. So you can see that this is the most challenging group. That, this is the reason I actually put this uh, slide here. Because when you see this uh, patient didn't have any symptom, but the patient is actually only actually assessing valve. These are the few points you need to take it very seriously. If you find one of these uh, changes, that uh, and that patient actually need, uh, need urgent uh, uh, surgery, surgical referral. And there is no dispute of when you say uh, guidelines is class one indication. And all other the severe aortic regurgitation and no symptom, you actually, like you do need to follow up, routine follow up, uh, some does in six months, some does in. Yeah, it depends on how you are practicing. When we start assessing aortic uh, valve, what are the things we look for? Uh, we need to document what is the body surface area. We need to document heart rate, heart rhythm, blood pressure. Uh, putting down uh, blood pressure is so crucial. If you have actually, if you have somebody have got wide pulse pressure and uh, um, uh, your assessment, uh, um, you got uh, severe aortic uh, regurgitation, that patient uh, actually outcome might be poor. And also I already discussed about talking about etiology and valve morphology. Actually, when you start assessing any valve, how many cuffs there, is a tricuspid valve or is a bicuspid valve? Uh, is there thickening? Is there any restriction? What is the doming and a prolapse calcification? And then you need to look for uh, jet direction and origin. What the jet is coming from is a central uh, is, is a fan out centrally and is it eccentric? Is it commissural? Is it ascending aorta dimension? These are very crucial when you actually assess valve. And severity, and there is, uh, they need to be very integrative approach. There is not any single method, and you can say, oh, this is the best method for this valve. So you need to assess on uh, vena contract, I'll talk through vena contract pressure, heart time, flow reversal arch. And also uh, LV dimension and function is also important. And again, emphasis is this is the most challenging group, chronic severe AR 
LV is almost always dilated and surgery is recommended as class one indication I mentioned. The AR on industrial diameter is 70 millimeter or more. LV uh, internal diameter is 50 millimeter or more. Ejection fraction is less than T. And now mechanism, I mentioned that I will talk about a little bit about mechanism. Type one, type two, and type three is almost uh, like Professor uh, Dr. Gobin showed uh, mitral valve uh, mechanism. It's almost aortic valve mechanism also we are actually doing. Try to find out what kind of mechanism is actually uh, present in this valve. There is three type in type one where you see normal cast motion with aortic dilatation. You can see the aortic and cast perforation. There is type two that is you can see clearly uh, cast and, and type three cast restriction. And the reason I put this slide, I, I think I'm not quite sure about what are, are you uh, doing any repair of aortic valve? Uh, if not, when you actually start repairing valve in Bangladesh, probably you need to think about, you need to actually find out the mechanism of uh, regulation. Like this one in type three, this is very, uh, you cannot repair that. On prolapse and type one and type two, it is repairable. You can actually save valve. Now, moving to uh, next slide is again uh, uh, in the right line uh, that says uh, when an aortic root di uh, diameter is more than 50 millimeters. Now, uh, going to this echo now. This is one of our patients uh, who has actually uh, came to our hospital because of on examination, we found he has uh, early diastolic uh, mama. And on scan, you can see he never had can, any kind of uh, problem. And if you look at his, uh, uh, this is left atrium, this is mit uh, mitral valve, this is aortic valve, and this is uh, LV, and this is uh, RV. When you look at his LV, it looks like a very big dilated LV. And he never had uh, uh, any kind of problem. And only one thing when he met his GP, he told us he has got big dizziness. And this is how it's a long extending actually hypertension, actually one of the causes for uh, um, aortic regurgitation. When you get anybody with uh, aortic regurgitation, we need to start with measuring. And I think probably you might uh, have different uh, opinion that thing I'm uh, trying to say now. You need to do internal to internal edge when you actually measure diameter. That is our practice. We, when we assess any valve, we need to do internal inner edge to inner edge. And, uh, and when you're actually doing a mid-systole, when you uh, actually measure, you need to uh, measure during mid-systole for annular uh, measurement for Sinus uh, and sinotubular junction and ascending aorta, you need to do in end diastole. Uh, and so this is how we do. And to read uh, European uh, Society uh, of Cardiology or American Society of Echo uh, Cardiography, uh, their guideline. In the guideline, they have mentioned uh, uh, measuring leading edge to leading edge. The problem uh, with the measuring from guideline leading edge to leading edge. The problem, because more and more we are actually comparing our echo data with other imaging modalities. For instance, we are actually comparing our, validating our data with CMR. So if you actually, if you look at read that guidelines, how in CMR and other modalities they are actually measuring amities in a race to in a race. So this is the, one of the biggest limitation of European society. You have to compare your data with CMR. So I would recommend you to measure in inner edge to inner edge. This, uh, this is, uh, I think there are lots of fellow attending this uh, conference. So we need to be familiar with all this kind of uh, way how we actually um, uh, assess valve. So the apical window, left parasternal window, supra external window. This is also very useful and I'll go through that slide. So why it is so, and also subcostal window is actually quite useful. And we are actually, when we assess valve, we need to try to apply as much as possible. So, and also when we actually measure diameter, remember one thing that when LV dilated, it dilated actually more of a spherical fashion. 
So sometimes it's a bit very tricky. Actually, if the uh, measurement is not correct, then obviously you'll be correct in wrong volume. Uh, so Doctor, that's volume. There are two minutes left, so please uh, start, uh, start two minutes left. So please start wrapping up your presentation. Okay, so this is a for the bicuspid aortic valve. You can see a dilated the ascending aorta. Okay, and, sir. Uh, when you actually assess somebody with young hypertensive patient with uh, dilated aorta, you need to go a bit uh, a space higher, otherwise you will miss uh, dilated short term ascending. You can see on this slide, you see they also have developed coa aorta. This is uh, associated. Uh, moving. So another important thing is like uh, when you actually do assess valve, you need to focus on like uh, aligning your probe on the flow. So if it is uh, what normally we expect, not more than 30 degree, ideally 20. Yes. If it is 90 degree, actually aligning your probe, then you will actually not get any flow. So it is a, so when we ask no, the we, we, we need to uh, look for a few things for that look at the sure. half time. Sure. When a contractor, sure. if it is uh, a uh, RV volume, so this is one of the slide. Uh, I just uh, lots of people actually assess when a mode color a mode, and what people think about it, less than one third of the diameter width of that uh, 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 and uh, think about is it severe. And if it is more, more than two third, third, then it is uh, uh, severe. That's the problem with uh, like actually 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 you, you overestimate central jet and underestimate uh, eccentric jet. And this is a, a vena contractor. The way we assess vena contractor, we need to uh, look down the uh, flow convergence. You need to go to the, and then the vena contractor is, is the narrowest portion of the uh, flow coming back to uh, left ventricular through the aortic valve. And you need to uh, look at the jet area. So this is actually quite important. So you need to be, uh, set up Nike stream at 50 to 60 centimeter. If it is uh, narrower, less than three millimeter is mild. If it is more than uh, seven millimeter is severe. And now the pressure half time is another important thing. When actually, yeah, uh, uh, pressure, I think probably you know how, how long it takes to uh, lose the aortic valve by half. So what you see here, and when you're actually measuring pressure half time, you need to bear in mind that vessels velocity at least have to be four centimeter. And if this is somebody with chronic uh, severe aortic regurgitation, if you look at this one, this is this is steps uh, fall so rapidly and coming to the baseline. This is somebody with uh, acute AR, and this is somebody with chronic AR, uh, chronic aortic And this is suprasternal. I mentioned the suprasternal uh, view is quite useful. Uh, it's a hollow diastolic. Uh, uh, you can see hollow diastole and flow velocity is more than 20 centimeter. You see this very specific marker of severe aortic regurgitation. And then, and also like if you hollow diastolic reversal of abdominal aorta, you actually can do subcostal window view. So if you see that, that's a specific of severe aortic regurgitation. Uh, so this is PISA. We routinely do PISA for all our patients. So what you need to do PISA, you see the jet and uh, it's coming through and this, this is the jet and you measuring, uh, you are actually measuring uh, jet there, and you can see the PJ radius. You're measuring that. You actually, uh, you can see your machine will calculate that uh, uh, regurgitant orifice area. And this is how actually you get information about that. So this is somebody with aortic regurgitation. I'm not going details of it. It's presented to two, three, and AVF uh, segment elevation. On scanning, we found that uh, he has got. And this is what you see is the dissection. We, you need to bear in mind that uh, dissection can uh, present with lute T3 and inferior OLMI. We shouldn't always look uh, for uh, seeing any changes in ascending aortic dilatation. So acute AR, what you need to do. So if you suspect so, and one of the problem in acute AR is a rapid increase in uh, end diastolic uh, diameter and uh, shape is always normal. This is somebody I wanted to show you. This is... Uh, I don't think I have enough time for that. So a uh, gradient of the severe tube aortic regurgitation. So you it just not only what you are doing assessing in 2D or 3D uh, or 2D method, or you need to actually put everything together. You need to put part of uh, is normal. Then you need to put color flow AR jet width, and you need to put down a continuous signal AR jet. 
and also semi quantitative you need to do when a contract date is less than 3 and that is my sir, uh, sir time is up yeah okay that's my last slide and so like, if i put together everything in like in philosophy in a combining echo some core values that embedded in your character uh, you can't change it in some attitude uh, it changes over time and combination of both is uh, like core behavior so if we put together everything here our core value that way we as as well we cannot change this all these theories what is uh, changeable like uh, the guideline they updated uh, regular then also in maybe a gu guidelines is uh, like usa updating guideline in future i think probably artificial intelligence will take over lots of thing in assessing our valve and that could be changed over time and our core values are uh, when you combine both of these then i think probably we could have better valve assessment thank you very much my apology to taking a couple thank you sir for your uh, valuable demonstration now i would like to request our next speaker dr nikan savarwal from uk to present guideline directed echocardiographic assessment of pulmonary hypertension dr nikan savarwal consultant cardiologist in oxford specializing in cardiac imaging as well as oxford specialist handbook in nuclear cardiology and valvular heart disease dr nikan savarwal Thank you. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. And you can see my talk? Yes, you're audible. Wonderful. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. So I've been asked to talk about the guideline directed echocardiographic assessment of pulmonary hypertension. And this is something that's... Sorry, coming... sir. Uh, your slide is not visible. Okay, hold on. So share this with that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So um, I've been asked to talk about the um, assessment of pulmonary hypertension using the latest guidelines. These have become to the prominence recently, and we'll go through this in some detail. So with a very quick summary of the definitions of pulmonary hypertension, why there's been a change in the guidelines, uh, we'll do some assessment of structure and function that we need for the pH assessment. I've got some nice case examples, I hope, for you, and we'll end up with a quick summary. So we know the mean pulmonary artery pressure on invasive assessment over 25 millimeters is considered significant pulmonary hypertension. And for decades, we've been using echocardiography by estimating the TR velocity and the right atrial pressure using the Bernoulli equation. And of course, there is a problem with this because whatever number we get, we square and then multiply by four. So any error is multiplied significantly. Now we know echocardiography can therefore overestimate and underestimate the pulmonary artery pressure and the agreement with catheter studies has been poor. So the latest guidelines suggest we should limit echocardiography to determining a probability of pulmonary hypertension and avoid spending too much time trying to estimate the pulmonary artery pressure itself. So the basic classifications you'll all know about, you know, class one is pulmonary arterial hypertension, uh, secondary to left heart disease for class two, class three is the lung disease, the chronic thrombobolic pulmonary hypertension and the unclear versions. And the important point from this slide is working out the pulmonary artery pressure, knowing what your left, uh, uh, what the wedge pressure is. Um, because if you have high left atrial pressure due to any form of left heart disease, that is actually very important to determine on the echocardiogram. So these are the guidelines that have been produced. Now, this is the British guidelines, but the Americans and the European guidelines are very similar. I'd highly recommend looking at this document. It's very helpful. It's a very well written document. It basically says, look at the TR velocity. If you're over 3.4 meters per second, you have a high probability of pH. If you're less than 2.8 and have less than two categories, now the categories are mentioned here at the bottom, you have A, B and C. You need any one of A or B or C. So any two out of these categories immediately puts you in the intermediate risk if you have a low velocity. If you're intermediate velocity, use the same two categories and that tells you whether you're intermediate or high risk. It's a very, very straightforward, very simple approach and the assessment of the ventricles, the PA and the IVC, I'm going to show shortly. So when it comes to the ventricles, um, all they're interested in is the eccentricity. Are you seeing a flat septum? Uh, if you have a flat interventricular septum, you have 
ticked one point for an echo criteria for rate of pulmonary artery pressure. And the other ventricular assessment is, are, is your RV diameter the, at the base bigger than your LV diameter at the base? Again, it's very straightforward. If the RV is bigger than the LV, you tick another point. On the PA parameters, a PA diameter of more than 25 millimetres. If you measure your PR velocity, you take an early PR velocity, anything more than 2.2 metres per second um, counts as an indicator of raised pulmonary pressure. RVOT acceleration time less than 105 milliseconds is a very good indicator of uh, a raised PA pressure. And don't forget this mid systolic notch. This is a very useful indicator of a raised pH. So if you've got any one of these, that again counts under your PA parameter for your guideline. And then the last thing they ask you to look at is the IVC. So IVC and RA together, if your IVC is more than 21 millimeters and there's a less than 50% reduction with your sniff test, you will um, tick one point. Or if your right atrial area um, in end systole is more than 18 square centimetres, so a big right atrium, that's another alternative way of getting your point. So I'll give you, I've got some cases lined up for you. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk through all of this. So these are just cases that we've had coming through our department in the last few weeks. Um, straightforward, we get the impression straight away that the RV is bigger than the LV. So straight away, you've got one of your minor echo criteria, if you want to call it that, that we don't have any significant mitral valve regurgitation. You get the feeling there's a, set, a flat septum here. So maybe we've got, um, uh, again, one point on the ventricular side because the big RV and the flat IV septum all count as one point, not two. There is some tricuspid valve regurgitation, as you'd expect, and the TR velocity comes out at 4.6 meters per second. So we're well above that 3.4 millimeter per second cutoff. So straight away, we will follow that algorithm shortly and I'll show you how it all works. Mitral inflow um, is impaired. We can see there's gonna be significant diastolic dysfunction. There's a very tall E-wave e and a very sharp deceleration time. So again, this now tells us, is there something going on in the left heart that's causing the right heart raised pulmonary pressure. And the final shot I've given you is the IVC. We can clearly see that's a big dilated IVC. The hepatic veins are very clear. I don't need to do the measurements. We all know that's going to be enlarged. And there's a less than 50% reduction when the patient's taken a sniff. So how do we integrate all of these bits and pieces together? So first of all, TR velocity more than 3.4 meters per second. So straight away on the right hand side, as I see it, that means we've got a high probability of pH. We can actually stop thinking if you want to, but we don't, we keep thinking. This patient's in AF, they have severe diastolic dysfunction and have a dilated and impaired RV. So we will conclude to say this patient does have a high probability of pulmonary hypertension, and this is due to left heart disease. This is severe diastolic dysfunction, AF, and this dilated and impaired RV is an adverse prognostic factor, and therefore, we give additional information, not just saying this patient has a high probability of pH. So case B, this is another patient that we saw just a few weeks ago. Um, now I see a case of this every three or four years in my practice. I'm guessing you see three or four patients like this every day. So clearly we can see this patient has rheumatic mitral valve stenosis. We definitely have a flat interventricular septum. There's some mitral regurgitation and you can clearly see on the four chamber view, lots of flow acceleration due to the mitral stenosis. When we look at the RV, it's definitely bigger at the basal level compared to the LV. So we have some criteria straight away that suggests this patient has some pulmonary hypertension. There's clearly tricuspid regurgitation. When we measure the TR velocity, it's well over 3.4 meters per second, so straight away into the high risk group. The IBC is dilated, there's less than 50%. Um, change in respiration. So this again is a very straightforward example of following the guidelines. The TR velocity, definitely more than 3.4 meters per second, was straight down this arm of the pathway, high probability of pH. And in this patient, we know they've got severe rheumatic mitral stenosis, as well as a dilated and impaired RV. It's this dilated impaired RV, which you know is an adverse, adverse prognostic sign. So again, this is another patient who's got a 
pH diagnosis, it's a high probability, that's clear, and this is due to left heart valve disease. And given the impaired and dilated RV, we know straight away that's an adverse prognostic factor, and this patient needs to move on to urgent mitral valve surgery. So hopefully these two cases are very straightforward. This is another patient I look after. Um, she's 89 and she's breathless. You can clearly see it's an abnormal heart. Uh, on the parasternal view, uh, big dilated RV, um, some septal flattening. It's very clear septal flattening on this particular view. So there's clearly going to be eccentricity. Dilated RV we've noted already. Mitral inflow isn't too bad. For an 89 year old, this is actually pretty good. So just a mild diastolic dysfunction. Um, we can measure tissue Doppler and everything else, but this is still just mild diastolic dysfunction. Her left heart is not the problem in this particular case. Of course, there's tricuspid valve regurgitation. The TR velocity in this patient is more difficult. This is a more of a real world case. Um, it's difficult to know exactly where it is. We could give saline to augment the um, uh, Doppler flow, but in this case, we were pretty happy to put it around here. It's in the intermediate range. It's more than 2.8, it's definitely less than 3.4. Her IVC is not dilated and her, it definitely collapses very nicely. When you measure her RV outflow tract velocity and VTI, we can clearly see that mid systolic notch on the bottom panel this mid systolic notch is one of those criteria for um, uh, raised pH. So this patient has a TR velocity that's between 2.8 and 3.4. They're straight down the intermediate group. We now need to look at our echo categories. So do you remember ventricle, dilated, flat septum, that's one point. Um, the second one is the um, everything to do with the pulmonary artery. Is it dilated? Do we have the mid systolic notch? Do you have the PR more than 2.2 seconds, a millimeter per second? Um, and then the final one is IVC RA. Is the IVC dilated? Is the RA dilated? Now in her situation, her IVC is not dilated, but the right atrium clearly is dilated. And in this, so this counts, and she actually has all three categories. So straight away, she falls down the middle and then straight into the high likelihood of uh, pulmonary hypertension. She's in sinus rhythm. She does not have left heart disease, but she does have a dilated and, and impaired RV. And actually her diagnosis is severe pulmonary hypertension or high probability of pulmonary hypertension. And she was a patient with CTEF, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. The dilated RV is interesting. I think that's chronic, but the small IVC is because she'd been diuresed. She'd been admitted to hospital with peripheral edema and was aggressively diuresed by the admitting medical team. And therefore that's why her inferior vena cava was small. And that explains that, uh, uh, small and narrow, that explains that uh, example. So the final case I have is um, another patient just seen very recently, again, big right ventricle. We've already seen a case of this in the tricuspid valve talk. You can clearly see a fixed open tricuspid valve on this RV inflow view with uh, torrential TR a good functioning left ventricle without, so there is no sign of septal flattening. Uh, and again, another view of this tricuspid valve, which is very fixed. So you, you'll all know the answer. Um, when we look at these views here, uh, on this sort of modified apical view, the uh, left heart is working very well, big dilated RV, that's straightforward. We again, we get another view of this torrential free flow uh, TR and some TS as well. Her mitral inflow isn't too bad. This lady's in her um, late 60s, early 70s. So for the UK, that's that's pretty good. And then we see the TR. Now the TR on this is a very intense dagger shaped. And when you see something like this, this is only, this, this flow uh, uh, picture is only with torrential TR. And we're well under the 2.8 meter per second um, criteria. It's difficult to see this lady's IVC, but you know, I'd say that it's not particularly dilated. Um, we don't see the hepatic veins. This is one of the patients where it's a bit more of a challenge, but we do see her, her pleural effusions quite nicely on this scan as well. So this lady's TR is less than 2.8. Um, so she goes straight down to the, into the, this lower end category. Does she have two echo categories? So her RA is dilated and the RV is dilated. So she actually fulfills two categories. Um, come on, comes under the intermediate probability of pulmonary hypertension. 
She's in sinus rhythm. We know she doesn't have left heart disease. And it's a dilated and not impaired RV. That RV is working quite well. And this is someone with carcinoid tricuspid valve disease. She has torrential TR. And this is someone with volume, not pressure overload. And this is an example of where this guideline doesn't work perfectly. And we have to remember this is a guideline, not a rigid protocol. This patient does not have pulmonary hypertension, but the torrential TR makes it very difficult to assess PA pressure. And although she does fall officially under the intermediate guideline or intermediate likelihood of pH, most of us would agree she's not going to have pulmonary hypertension. This is straightforward case of carcinoid tricuspid valve disease without pulmonary hypertension. This is a volume loaded hyperdynamic system, not pressure loaded. So I'll go through these guidelines again. We look at the TR, you measure the velocity, and if it's anything less than 3.4, you have to look at your echo categories. And the categories are based on ventricle or PA or IVC RA. If it's ventricle, it can either be eccentricity or a dilated RV. If it's PA, look at your velocity, remember, um, an acceleration time less than 105 milliseconds or that mid-systolic notch or the high PR velocity or the dilated PA. Any of those gives you one mark. And for the IVC, a big RA area and a big IVC with reduced respiratory change. You only need one point from each of these groups, add them up, more than two echo categories, it immediately pushes you from either low to intermediate or intermediate to high probability of pulmonary hypertension. So in conclusion, um, using echo, now we're going to suggest we just measure or determine a probability of pulmonary hypertension. We're not so interested in the absolute values of what we think the PR pressure is, uh, to, that's what we think the PA pressure is. It's over 3.4 or less plus two of these parameters. Echo's brilliant at determining the etiology if it's due to the left heart. And I've given the example of someone with diastolic heart failure causing pulmonary hypertension, or if they've got a shunt. Clearly anything like this, this is where echocardiography comes into its own. If they've got pure lung disease, we're not, we, we, it's more, more challenging to determine what's going on. But we can also determine prognosis if the RV is dilated, if there is RV dysfunction by whatever method you want to use. So feel free to do RV tissue Doppler, look at the S wave. If you find RV dysfunction with RV dilatation, they're immediately in a lower, a poorer prognos prognostic group. I would strongly recommend looking at the guidelines. This is one example of them from the, the British Society. Um, the um, European and the American guidelines are very similar, um, but they all say the same thing now. We should determine probability. Don't get worried about absolute values of PA pressure. Try to determine the etiology, especially if it's left heart related, and try and determine the prognosis, because that is important. I'm going to leave you with this quote from a very famous physician who worked in the UK. Medicine is the science of uncertainty and the art of probability. Thank you very much. Unmute. Thank you, sir, for your valuable presentation. Now I would like to request our next speaker, Dr. Resham Barua from UK to deliver it in the topic of echocardiographic importance of pulmonary valve. Dr. Resham Barua, consultant cardiologist and heart failure lead, Chelsea and Westminster NHS Foundation Trust. Honorary Senior Lecturer, Imperial College, and Honorary Consultant, Royal uh, Brampton Hospital, Dr. Resham Bora. Hi there. So thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this wonderful Congress and conference. Um, can I just check that you can see my screen and that you can hear me? Yeah, yes, yes. Great. Yes, Thank you. Perfect. So I will carry on, although it is a tough act to follow that. And you will have heard some of the things that I'm going to talk about today um, in the presentations before. Um, I appreciate that I'm probably coming towards the end of your day and you're all rather tired and you've had lots of wonderful talks. So I will try and keep this brief. Um, so the pulmonary valve, as we all know, is a tri-leaflet semi-lunar valve. It's similar to the um, aortic valve. They, 
um, develop embryologically in parallel before the um, pulmonary valve moves anteriorly and superiorly, but it's much thinner than the aortic valve. And most of the disorders to do with the pulmonary valve are congenital disorders. And as you will see later, it is actually possible to survive without a pulmonary valve. So this is often thought of as the Cinderella valve, the forgotten valve. So transthoracic echocardiogram, the mainstay of the images that we're going to use to image the pulmonary valve are going to be the parasternal views. It's possible in your long axis views by modulating your um, probe to, if you uh, modulate your probe upwards to see the pulmonary valve, remember it's a very thin leafleted valve. And we're going to do most of our measurements in this view, which you're all familiar with, which is the short axis view. So you can see that you can see the uh, pulmonary valve, the main pulmonary artery in the left and the right pulmonary branches on that short axis view. And that's where we're going to do our Doppler measurements. It's also possible to get views substernally and suprasternally using transthoracic echocardiography. However, as I say, short axis view is, is the predominant view that we're going to use in echocardiography. In terms of TOE, if we think about um, where our TOE probe is, it's posterior. And as I've already told you, the pulmonary valve is the anterior structure, so it's far field. And therefore TOE is not the, um, uh, modality of choice for visualizing the pulmonary valve. You, we do use the inflow outflow valve uh, views and in patients in whom we don't have transthoracic decent images, if you want to do Doppler measurements than usual transgastric view. It's going to be particularly difficult in patients who have had um, uh, aortic prostheses. This is gonna cause a lot of um, artifact and um, further um, reduce what you can see. So TOE is not the modality of choice here. And so how are we going to detect pulmonary stenosis? Well, we're going to use our color Doppler to look for those high velocity jets and to try and localize the origin. For our students who are, who are at this conference, we're going to use pulse wave to find out the site of the obstruction, and we're going to use continuous wave to find out the peak velocity. And normally, we're look, this is a low resistance system, and we've got velocities around 1 to 1 1.5 meters per second. So we've just had a fantastic talk about um, pulmonary hypertension. And in that, we heard about the um, notching which can be um, mid-systolic or it can be uh, late as a sign of the pulmonary hypertension. We can also look at acceleration time. So that's the time in milliseconds from the onset of ejection to the peak systolic velocity, normally 140 milliseconds. And we just heard from the last presentation that we're, we're using the tricuspid regurgitation for the mainstay of diagnosis in pulmonary hypertension and for our physiological measurements, but not all patients will have sufficient tricuspid regurgitation. You can try and fluid load with saline, but you may be forced to use your pulmonary velocities or, or you may wish to use your pulmonary velocities to support or refute um, the potential. So if you have a very short acceleration time, um, then that is more suggestive of pulmonary hypertension. But acceleration time, as you can imagine, is very dependent on heart rate. So if you are tachycardic or if you have a heart rate of less than 75 beats per minute, then we need to correct that acceleration time to take it back into account. And that's how you do it. You time that acceleration time by 75 and divide by the heart rate to normalize the heart rate. Again, not pathognomic, but can help support um, the, the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. And um, if you put your M mode um, 
uh, cursor through where you would normally use your Doppler cursor. You can use M mode to show mid diastolic closure of that pulmonary valve, which is, is, is similar to that notching phenomenon. You can use um, the PR um, velocity, the end diastolic velocity to try and estimate um, PA pressures. As you'll see there. So um, these bottom two traces, that's what your normal um, uh, pulmonary velocity, the forward flow looks like. Can be triangular, can be more parabolic, parabolic, but as we heard just in the last talk, if you see that notching, then that suggests that there are reflected waves from that pulmonary hypertension and, uh, and, and that that is seen in some patients with pulmonary hypertension, but it's neither sensitive nor specific. So pulmonary stenosis, seven to 12% of congenital heart disease patients. It's the most common cause of congenital outflow tract obstruction, right side lesions. And the vast majority of these are at the valvular level but it's possible to get supravalvular and subvalvular stenosis and subvalvular stenosis is associated with VSDs and all pulmonary stenosis can occur in conjunction with other congenital abnormalities. In terms of your chest x-ray, you see a enlarged PA silhouette and um, paucity of, uh, of, of um, pulmonary vascularity. Remember when you're taking your Doppler measurements for the pulmonary valve, it's a right-sided um, valve and therefore it's going to vary with respiration far more than uh, your left side of velocity. So we need to average. So take, take more than one beat and average. Um, look at, so we're going to localize the site. Is it valvular? Is it supravalvular? Is it subvalvular? We're going to look at the valve morphology. Does it look like these leaflets are thickened? Are they doming? Um, are they dysplastic? Calcification, unlike um, with the aortic valve, is relatively rare and it's very patchy. It, it seems to calcify in a different way to the aortic valve. Um, and it's possible to get unicuspid and bicuspid pulmonary valves, particularly in tetralogy of phallus. So in terms of the dysplastic valves here, you'll see an image of a dysplastic pulmonary valve, very thickened, myxomatous um, uh, valve leaflets, no commissural fusion. Um, and in addition to the valve itself, the pulmonary annulus and outflow tract may be um, narrowed. And this is commonly seen in Noonan syndrome which, uh, as you may know, can be both sporadic and autosomal dominant. Numerous genes have been implicated, one in 1,000 to one in 2,500 life births. Patients have this very characteristic um, uh, phenotype. So um, uh, some people originally described this as the sort of male equivalent of Turner's syndrome with the webbing of the neck, short stature, um, widely spaced nipples. Remember, it's equally common in males and females because it's autosomal dominant. And it occurs with um, in conjunction with other cardiac defects. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, um, atrioceptal defects, ventricular septal defects, AVSDs, coarctations, PDAs, and tetralogy of phallus. So the other condition that you often see associated uh, or you may see associated with pulmonary stenosis, forgive me, is the um, condition we also saw in the last talk, which is carcinoid. So just a quick reminder on carcinoid. Typically, we think of it affecting the tricuspid valve, but it can also affect the pulmonary valve and the subvalvular apparatus for both those valves. So this is a rare neuroendocrine malignancy that um, originates most commonly, but not exclusively, from the entochromaffin cells in the gastrointestinal tract. Relatively rare, and um, we know this condition because it secretes the vasoactive substances 
particularly when it metabolizes to the um, liver because uh, these substances then travel via the um, hepatic vein and they cause the classical symptoms of flushing and diarrhea. What do we see on echo? We see thickening of the valve leaflets and reduced leaflet excursion. So in the case of um, uh, the pulmonary valve, we not only get uh, pulmonary uh, regurgitation, but we also get pulmonary stenosis. So eventually you end up with these very fixed, retracted, non-coapting leaflets. And if the pulmonary valve is involved, we will just see in a case of severe tricuspid regurgitation um, in the absence of pulmonary hypertension in the previous talk. But if the pulmonary valve's involved, as you might imagine, that's going to worsen any tricuspid regurgitation. Okay, and this is an example of supravalvular pulmonary stenosis, and we see this in conditions such as Williams um, syndrome. So why do we get a subvalvular um, stenosis? So this is also sometimes known as infundibular pulmonary stenosis. So we've got um, obstruction for uh, to the outflow from the RV below the level of the valve. And I've, I've only given myself one MRI image in this echo talk, but actually if you have access to CMR, that really is the modality of choice for imaging that, for imaging the right and in particular the pulmonary valve. But most commonly it's due to a fibrous muscle, uh, fibrous band or muscle band at the junction of the main cavity of the RV and the infundibulum. And so that almost gives you two, it almost um, separates off that RV, but you may also just get muscular thickening at the infundibular, uh, infundibulum itself to cause that narrowing. And here we go back to our short axis um, transthoracic image to look to see where that thickening is. And it's usually in association with other conditions um, such as tetralogy or a, a BSD. So this is an image of a um, pulmonary vein vegetation that can also both obstruct flow and also cause degeneration of the valve and um, pulmonary regurgitation commonly seen in um, people that have had interventions on the right side, so um, intravenous drug users or people that have long-term um, intravenous catheters, cannulas in dialysis patients. And again, short axis transthoracic view, you can see it all so the lesions such as fibroelastomas are uncommon, but can occur associated with the pulmonary valve as well. So these are, this is how we um, determine the severity of pulmonary valve stenosis and exactly the same as our right-sided lesions. Peak velocity of greater than four meters per second is the equivalent of um, severe pulmonary stenosis. Okay, so um, as I said, it is very possible to survive without a pulmonary valve at all. And this was a case report I found of an individual who had um, a valvotomy and, and had his valve removed in childhood um, for, for a congenital disease uh, and lived for 32 years without a valve at all before his RV failed. Um, so uh, as I said, it is possible to survive without a pulmonary valve though it may not be ideal. Um, pulmonary regurgitation may be associated with pulmonary stenosis as we saw with the carcinoid, um, maybe secondary to annular or PA dilatation. So as we saw before with the pulmonary hypertensives, if the whole of that um, outflow tract gets very, very dilated, then that may lead to some pulmonary regurgitation and it commonly occurs post um, fallow repair. Um, the mainstay here is colored Doppler, but be aware it's going to be, it's, it's harder to determine because we are looking at a low pressure system. And uh, as I say, the pulmonary valve may be congenitally absent. The 
tools for trying to estimate the severity of pulmonary regurgitation are far less well validated than for left-sided aortic regurgitation. Oh, and I should, sorry, I should have said, um, it's very common to get a little bit of um, mild PR, usually has absolutely no um, clinical significance whatsoever. The RV seems to tolerate um, extra volume relatively well, in fact. Okay, so these images on the right are for patients post tetralogy of fallow repair, and we can see in this left-hand column, mild pulmonary regurgitation, in the middle column, we have moderate pulmonary regurgitation and on the right, we have severe pulmonary regurgitation. So in mild, as I say, very, very common people watching this, you or I may well have a little bit of mild pulmonary regurgitation, no clinical significance whatsoever. And you can see that there's no diastolic flow reversal in the branch pulmonary arteries on that side compared to moderate and severe. Um, you can, in the past, people have looked at the length of the penetration into the RV of that jet. Again, this, is, uh, this correlates poorly clinically because we're looking at a low pressure system to begin with. Um, you can also look at the size, the vena contractor width and the width in relation to the width of the RVOT. But similarly um, to that, uh, TR signal and the density, you can look at the density of the regurgitant uh, signal. Um, and you may want to look at other clues as to how severe your regurgitation is. For example, um, do you have RV dilatation? It's also possible to do a ratio oh, yeah. Dr. Reshim uh, yes. two minutes left, so please start your uh, wrapping up uh, your presentation. Fine. Two no minutes problem. left. Thank you. Um, you can also look at the VTI ratio. Oh, I'm sorry. You can look at the VTI ratio of forward flow to backward flow um, and, and uh, to determine the degree of uh, regurgitation. This is an okay measurement where it starts to fall down is when your RV is starting to fail. So here we have the ESC guidelines for the for determining um, pulmonary regurgitation, and uh, and and as I say, color Doppler forms a part of this. The density of the regurgitant jet, the width of the vena contractor. It is possible to measure um, your regurgitant orifice area and your regurgitant volume, but as I say, it's uh, not defined and not validated. Okay, so final slide is very difficult image, particularly by echocardiography. If you're going to use echocardiography, you need to use um, transthoracic, not TOE, because it is um, anterior. And uh, in terms of the general principles, that the general principles that we apply to all our valves, so we're going to look at the morphology of the valve the site of any stenosis, and we're going to try and quantify the severity using Doppler. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Resha Morio, for your valuable presentation. Now, I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Fabiola Soji from Italy, uh, to present role of stress echocardiography, basic and beyond. Dr. Fabiola Soji, consultant senior cardiologist, Polyclinical University Hospital, Milan, Italy. Dr. Fabiola Soji, please. Yes. Uh, good afternoon. Can you see me and uh, my slides? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, so uh, the audio and the slides are visible. So, ma'am, your uh, slide is not sharing. Please uh, share your slides. Oh, yes, sure. I thought I did. Is it okay? It's okay, I think. Yes, Can you see the slides and uh, uh, hear to me, hear me well? Yes. Yes. Yeah, visible okay. and audible both. 
It's visible and the audio is good. Great. <laughs> thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee. It's uh, such a big honor for me to be here. I feel a bit in Bangladesh, though I'm Milan, you know, and uh, I hope to come to Bangladesh one day. But the meeting is excellent. I learned so much. I am going to dedicate the coming 20 minutes to an old subject, uh, stress echo. Stress echo from business to beyond. How can we be original with um, uh, a subject that has been treated for more than 40 years? Uh, we have uh, evidence based on solid uh, literature about uh, uh, clinical, uh, about the pathophysiology of stress echo. But let's try. Uh, stress echo is uh, a test that uh, uh, has uh, several um, indications. Ischemia uh, is still this, uh, uh, the most common indication. Viability, uh, stress echo for valve disease, if you want to evaluate a low fall low gradient autostenosis, for instance, or mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation. So we have stress echo for valve. And then we have a stress echo for the evaluation of diastole, which is emerging uh, physical stress echo uh, for diastole. I will concentrate more in the most common, so stress echo for ischemia. What ischemia is, uh, it's a transient change in function, in uh, regional ventricular function. And uh, we, uh, with our echo, we want to detect this left wall motion abnormality that is not present at rest. So we use uh, echo so with imaging. We interpreted the ECG and in the exercise echo, in the, as in the exercise ECG, and uh, we uh, pay attention to symptoms. We have several equipment, several protocols. I don't want to um, bore you now with this uh, uh, details, but we know that uh, dobutamine is one of the most used, especially in the past. Uh, and it, uh, it uh, uh, is based on the increase of oxygen demand. So many studies on dobutamine, but also many studies on vasodilators, especially in Italy, the still phenomenon related to the decrease of oxygen uh, due to the um, change in supply. We look for uh, wall motion abnormalities at rest and during stress and during recovery. So we expect when we look for ischemia, a normal function at rest, normal kinesis, like we have here, normal kinesis. And then during stress, we have a worsening. This is ischemia. A worsening can be at low dose, can be at peak or at recovery. We can also have a biphasic response, like in this case, so improvement at low dose and worsening at peak. So this is a type of equation of ischemia. Normal stress echo means normal function at rest, normal function during stress, and normal function during recovery. And then we can look for viability when we have a kinetic segment or hypokinetic segment at rest and we want to interpret it. This segment can uh, gain advantage by revascularization. So we study patient that had already a myocardial infarction in this case. Uh, ischemic cascade is um, a, a hierarchically uh, well-defined sequence. Uh, time speaking, uh, when uh, we induce ischemia, the, we have first, the forerunner is the flow heterogeneity, a gap between endocardial and subepicardial perfusion. Ischemia is a, a centrifugal phenomenon according to the LV cavity. So it goes first to uh, involve the endocardium and then the uh, subepicardium. And uh, the first change, time speaking, is perfusion. And this is what we evaluate with the contrast, stress echo, with CMR, and with nuclear studies. And then, uh, time speaking, we have after metabolic changes, which means uh, a cause for alteration in uh, regional mechanical function. The dispression, dispression is diastolic dysfunction and systolic dysfunction. And this is uh, the time of the stress echo. And then we have last, the ECG changes and the symptoms. 
a part of the huge diagnostic value that we all know, the sensitivity is very high, the specificity is very high, the accuracy is very high, depending, of course, also on the type of the population that we are going to analyze. But certainly, we have reached an average of more than 80% of accuracy. Uh, we have to consider a long history on the predicting value uh, about the outcome of our patients. And uh, uh, we realized that stress echo is able to stratify our patient. Uh, Daniel Mark is a professor from Duke University and back to the 80s, uh, he evaluated the exercise treadmill test. And uh, he looked uh, at the HEG changes, he looked at the symptoms, he looked at the time of the uh, stress lasting. And uh, he uh, created a score, the Duke treadmill score, still uh, a score that we use, uh, still a score that permits everyday practice. And uh, uh, using this score, he could stratify the risk patient. According to the Duke treadmill score, we have patient at low risk, intermediate risk, and a high risk. Uh, stratification means uh, uh, to evaluate uh, the uh, capability of te the test of being diagnostic and uh, able in being prognostic for patient with no world motion abnormalities at rest in general about stress echo. Here with the ECG test was an ECG that was normal at rest. It's very important to talk about stratification and uh, to talk about uh, uh, risk, pretest risk. Uh, statistics in medicine uh, is based, uh, um, the majority of our test, medical tests, are based on the bias theorem. What is this bias theorem? I mean, all the studies mention this uh, bias theorem. Uh, first of all, who was the inventor? It's uh, Thomas Bias, a mathematician from England uh, who lived in the uh, 1800s. So he discovered in the 1762 300 years ago, I mean, more than 200, a, a, an application, a, a formula uh, that is the core of the risk certification of our patient. This is a, a, his a, a mathematical um, formula. Uh, it's what is important, I mean, in this uh, uh, mathematical concept uh, is the base of the clinical decision applied to heart about apply to coronary artery disease. Look at this picture. This is a school. You see uh, boys and girls. Some has trousers, some has skirts. I want to uh, make a simple example of what bias theory is. Uh, if uh, we are observers of this school and randomly look at one student from distance, the question is, is that guy, is that person, uh, that, that is the person that is wearing trousers, a boy or a girl? Uh, the bottom line is that uh, um, men wear all trousers, girls wear trousers 50%. So 50% has a tr trousers and 50% have skirts. Looking uh, from distance, a bias, the bias theory is trying to make a percentage of probability of finding our answer. It seems complicated, but it's not. And it's the base of statistics for us. I just want to show that this is a school mixed uh, with the skirt and the trousers. It's, we are not in Scotland where boys wear uh, all skirts. But apart of this, uh, we take an example. 100 students, 60 are boys, 50, 40 are girls. Among these 100, uh, all the boys you consider they have trousers. 50% of the girls have trousers and 50% have skirts. So how can we have an answer? Uh, according to that formula, uh, we know that uh, the people with trousers is 60 plus 20, so 50% of the population of women, of girls, which means 80 divided 20, which is the population of women, of girls with trousers and with skirts. And we have the 25% rate 
25% is our answer. How can we say it? Because of that formula. And the probability analysis has um, an application in our daily practice about the pretest. So this is the application that we use in the pretest. Bias is saying, uh, given a patient with a positive test, so we perform a stress echo, a nuclear CT, MRI, whatever, a positive test, the patient has symptoms, but the patient has an unknown history of coronary artery disease, so we don't know about his coronary arteries. And we make the test. Uh, what is the real post-test probability? So the reliability of the result of our test. We have to consider, according to bias, the factor test, which means the accuracy of the test. But we have, important, very important, to consider the pre-test probability. Looking at our population of girls and boys is uh, the number of each of the two gender and uh, the likelihood of having trousers or of having skirts. We stratify patients. We said this is uh, taken from the guidelines of 2019 from, uh, for coronary, um, chronic coronary syndrome. And the guidelines, the European Society guidelines are saying uh, that, uh, of course, in accordance to the bias uh, theorem, the majority of our patients uh, are in the intermediate group of risk of coronary artery disease because of risk factors. Uh, and that group is the one that derives the maximum benefit for the, from the differentiation uh, of um, the population between intermediate and high risk. I want to make it more clear. We have uh, three types of tests, non big chapters, non invasive tests for ischemia, uh, functional tests. So we said the functional test is MRI, is nuclear, is a stress echo. And then we have a non invasive other tests, anatomical, uh, which is the computer tomography. And then we have a diagnostic test that is invasive and is the coronary angiography. We should send to the non-invasive test uh, for ischemia, uh, the functional test, the intermediate high population risk of coronary artery disease based on the evidence uh, of the study of these 35 years. And then a coronary CT scan uh, should be more dedicated to patients at low risk, so low clinical likelihood of coronary artery disease because it's a test very specific, but less sensitive. So the accuracy comes more from the specificity. In brackets, I want to say the bias phenomenon is uh, also the rule that is behind the concept of sensitivity, specificity, accuracy, negative predictive value, positive predictive value. And when we discuss a test, we always use this criteria. And then we should send to invasive coronary angiography only patient in the very high risk of coronary artery disease, very high risk, because 95% they need revascularization. So um, going back to this uh, guidelines, 2019, I said, uh, what uh, do they state? They say, use, we recommend the use of non-invasive functional imaging test for ischemia in patients with symptoms and unknown history of coronary artery disease uh, as initial test. Class of recommendation uh, one, level of evidence B, 1B. So it's something that we are seeing since 10 years, 15 years, but it's still the same. So uh, to make it uh, more in example, uh, I want to show you a few cases. Uh, stress echo uh, in a, a man of 75 years old with no previous history of coronary disease, hypertension, yes, smoking habit, yes. So let's say intermediate risk of coronary disease. The patient comes with uh, exceptional dyspnea. He can uh, practice exercise. So we advise uh, exercise stress echo. If he has a physical anatomical uh, limitation, better pharmacological stress echo. So he can do a, a Bruce 
test uh, with a semi-supine bed, we can acquire our imaging for chamber view. Look at yes, the base, uh, the uh, low dose, the peak and the recovery, the fourth um, chamber view in the four stages. And we have normal function. Uh, you see, this is an artifact, of course. Uh, and then uh, normal contraction in all the uh, segments of the four chamber view. Similarly, two chamber view, normal contraction, anterior and inferior wall in the all stages. And then same story uh, for the um, uh, short axis view. I'm not showing it here. So this means negative test, apparently. So no stress induced left ventricular wall motion abnormalities. Are we satisfied with this interpretation? Let's look to numbers. This is base, and we see that the heart rate is 50 uh, bit per minute. Uh, the patient actually is also in beta blockers because of hypertension, it was treated with an abibolol. So uh, quite a, a low uh, heart rate. And then we have at peak 72 bit per minute, which is nothing. I mean, we didn't reach our target heart rate. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, that uh, the workload was not uh, uh, proper. We didn't reach uh, what we should have done. It means that our test is not diagnostic. It's not diagnostic because uh, we um, haven't proved our patient. Uh, remember, according to uh, Robert Bruce uh, criteria, uh, a good workload is uh, obtained when you have a peak heart rate more than or equal 85%, and then you have to consider also the double pressure product. So the test has to be done properly, not only uh, stages. Another case, a 60 years old man, previously had fear potential smoking, looks like intermediate risk again, uh, with atypical symptoms, he's not coming with chest pain, but he's coming with syncope. And then he can practice exercise, he does, and then uh, we have uh, the four chamber view. And what do we see at uh, uh, stress? During stress, this is normal contraction in the lateral and septum at rest. Uh, something is changing during stress. You see this uh, hypokinetic uh, septum and also the lateral, the apical lateral uh, segment uh, seems to be hypokinetic. And in the two chamber view, we have a normal function here, but we have worsening here in the uh, apical anterior segment. And then, uh, in uh, uh, to, I mean, to make a conclusion, what do we see? Uh, we have uh, hypokinesia, score two, normal is one, only in three segments, which is sufficient for definition of ischemia. Ischemia should be de demonstrated in uh, two or more segments. And uh, so we conclude that the patient has uh, ischemia in the apical segments. It looks like uh, the territory of the LAD. Do you agree? Uh, yes, I mean, it is. Uh, so uh, is it really hypokinetic? Uh, this uh, territory shows uh, ischemia. Look at the ECG. Remember the ischemic cascade? Uh, the uh, downsloping of the ECG is something that is shown later. Uh, so first we have the perfusion abnormalities and then we have all motion abnormalities and then we have the ECG abnormalities. That's why the exercise stress test, the exercise um, stress test without echo, I mean, just uh, doing a exercise ECG uh, has a lower, significantly lower sensitivity compared to the stress echo. It's because it's related uh, to uh, the um, temporary phenomenon of ischemia. You have to see it by one, two minutes, then it disappears. So the exercise ECG can be negative, but the whole motion of abnormalities uh, maybe was shown, but if you do just the exercise ECG, you don't see it. Anyhow, going back to this case, we see that the patient has all no wall motion abnormalities in the apical segments, but has also a downsloping of the ST in V4, V5, and this uh, precordial lips. So we have a correspondence. And then we send a patient to the coronary angiography, intermediate risk, positive exercise HG, but especially positive wall motion for wall motion abnormalities. And we see a lesion in the LAD. So our test was certainly 
diagnostic, a diagnostic. I want to show you another case. It's a man, it's a woman, sorry, of uh, 69 years old. Madam, two yes. minutes left. Two minutes left. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, she has a history of coronary disease and she has also chest pain. So some stents, let's uh, forget the details. And then this is the ECG and you see down sloping during stress. Seems to be positive exercise, ECG test. And then we look the echo, which is done at the same uh, stage. And then uh, what do we see at rest, at low dose, at peak recovery, normal contraction in the four chamber view. And then uh, go back to the two chamber view. And then uh, we see normal contraction again in the all segments. Uh, and then uh, uh, parastena long axis view is saying the same, normal contraction. I said you something going back to the previous case. Uh, when you have a discordance between the ECG, exercise ECG and uh, the echo, which one should be considered? Is this a positive stress echo? Of course it is a positive stress echo. Remember the hierarchy of the ischemic cascade. And then uh, this is the last patient, 70 years old, hypertension, diabetes, obesity. Uh, what do we think? Probably obesity, low quality. Uh, yes, it's true. He has a, a low uh, quality at the echo, but he is referred for exercise ECG because he has chest pain. And then we use contrast because contrast uh, makes our exam as a perfusional test and has a very a good additional value because we visualize the endocardial border that wouldn't be visualized otherwise so well. You see, in this case, we have normal function in the four chamber view and you have normal function in the two chamber view. So consider also the use of contrast in this type of patient. I uh, forget the um, next case, but I want to go to the prognostic value. We said at the beginning, 40 years of history, 40 years, what can we say in terms of survivors? This is a study of last year, one center, uh, 5,900 patient big, uh, 35 years of experience in dipyridamol, dobutamine stress echo. And what do they say? They say that when they analyzed the patient that was studied uh, in the 90s, and you can see uh, the blue line, you have a different behavior compared to the patient and, and analyzed in the last decades. The purple line, years 20, I mean 2010, 2016, and then yellow and green is in between. So they divided the four decades 10 by 10, more or less. And then we see that the survival is worse in these decades, in the one that we are living in. But this, uh, uh, the population was similar. So all patient with a negative stress echo because of the That's low true. risk. And why? Because the population is changing. Uh, our population is changing in the risk profile. We have older patient, more frequently diabetic, more frequently under anti-ischemic therapy. So tailor your test based on the appropriate risk category, bias, bias rule. Thank you very much for your attention and greetings from Milan. Stay with the masks. Thank, Thank you, you. ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks for your brilliant presentation. Now I would like to request our next and last speaker, Dr. Kersibira uh, Hisroba from Bulgaria to present ecographic assessment of infective endocarditis and mass lesion. Associate Professor Kasimira Histrobai is a specialist cardiologist, expert of echocardiography, cardiac magnetic resonance, chronic heart failure, congenital heart disease, and pediatric cardiology at National Heart Hospital, Sofia, Bulgaria. Sir, uh, please. Good Dr. Kasimira Histroba. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes, ma'am. You are so, please share your screen, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Good evening from Sofia. Uh, thank you 
very much for the Dr. Fatima and all organizing committee that invited me for this interesting scientific meeting in uh, Dhaka in Bangladesh. I am very honored about this. So my presentation is focused mainly on the infection endocarditis and uh, lymph ventricle masses, uh, but I will try to be very short about this big uh, topic. So I don't have any disclosure about this presentation. Uh, I'm starting with one question about uh, what is about your opinion. How is uh, very often is uh, the infection of endocarditis in the contemporary Western cohorts? One to seven, uh, uh, 100,000 person per year, 50, 70, or five, three, five to seven of the thousand person per year, or five to seven thousand person per year. Actually, this is the very old uh, inflammation disease, which is uh, uh, the first mentioned from the Professor Osler in 1885 about uh, the inflammation, which uh, located generally of the flow, flow site of the valves and uh, all of the, located of the endocardial damaged area of the image of the heart. Sorry. Like epidemiology, we, we can find that annually incidence of the endocarditis is around five to seven person per uh, 100,000 people uh, of the uh, location. So it's very uncommon disease, but it's associated with a significant morbidity and mortality. And this is the one of the third of the life threatening infection after the sepsis and pneumonia and the uh, human human uh, this, uh, life. So it's mainly predominated of the male uh, than females, it's around uh, two point per one, and age is on, uh, which is also this disease uh, is over the sixty per men of the older than men, a woman. It's very uncommon for the children, but is uh, occur when it's uh, uh, treated for the congenital heart disease. The mitral valve is uh, very often uh, involved in this disease. When we can have the diagnosis about the infective endocarditis, we are looking about the major and the minor criteria, which is very important. When we have uh, this uh, positive blood culture from the typical organism, persistent the positive blood culture for the any organism, uh, single positive blood culture for the cornati uh, and echocardiography positive uh, signs for the infective endocarditis. There is also the minor criteria, which is the predisposition for the heart condition of the infective the valve disease, uh, high fever than uh, 80, 38 degrees, and uh, vascular phenomena like uh, arterial embolism, septic pulmonary infarction, mycotic aneurysm, uh, genuine lesion, and microbiological evidence that is does, doesn't meet like the measure criteria. Also, the positive blood culture it would not meet the major criteria, and uh, like some of the immunologic phenomena about this disease. Uh, when we look at uh, the uh, echocardiography the criteria, we are using uh, this new criteria, which is uh, must have the positive echocardiogram, oscillating intracardiac mass or absence of the, or new parts of the senses of the prosthetic valve or new valvular regurgitation. This is the one very nice case, which is endocarditis, which is involved the mitral valve. And this is a 3 day echo of this uh, huge vegetation that we could find during the echo examination. Uh, diagnosis of the clinical criteria is uh, Definitely, we have uh, the disease of the uh, infective endocarditis when we have two major criteria, or one major and three minor criteria, or five minor criteria. It's possible to have infective endocarditis when we have one major criteria, one minor, or three min min minor criteria. And we rejected the diagnosis when we don't have the, any alternative diagnosis, we don't have the resolution of the syndromes, uh, less than four days, no pathological ev evidence of the infective endocarditis after antibiotic treatment for less than four days. 
eco future on, of the vegetation this is the ecogenic mobile mass which is located mainly on the edge of site of the mitral valve ventricular site of the uh, aortic valve it's a very shaggy irregular uh, more of the time is amorphous uh, intermediate echogenesis we can find like uh, look like the myocardium uh, the motions is very independent independent of the valve this is oscillating and uh, very often is associated with the tissue deforma uh, deformation and destruction of the valves also then we have uh, the risk factor, which is connected more often with the, uh, this disease. Uh, we, most of the uh, time, we could find the uh, previously dental treatment, uh, genital heart disease, unusual heart murmur, rheumatic fever, mitral valve prolapses, and uh, cardiac valve uh, surgery. Uh, who is need from the prophylaxis of the endocarditis? Uh, when we have actually prior, prior infection of endocarditis, when we have the patient with the prostatic valves, uh, we must include this uh, prostatic with the prostatic material when we use the valve repair. Uh, patient with the congenital heart disease and valvulopotiva after cardiac transplantation. This, this uh, group of the patients, they are definitely need prophylaxis from the infective endocarditis. Imaging uh, of the uh, infective endocarditis is very important. And uh, when we have uh, this cardiac uh, examination with the ACG echo, cardiac CT, uh, PET CT and cardiac MRI, more often we can find the vegetation, but the echocardiography, mainly transthoracal and transesophageal, is the this is the main uh, and very use, uh, useful and very easy to perform uh, for the bedside of the patient. The goal is uh, actually to assess the cardiac structure and function, assess the perianal anatomy, assess the conduction system function and the coronary anatomy. Non-cardiac uh, examination is included the CT, MRI, which uh, main goal is uh, actually uh, to assess the mycotic aneurysm, uh, the sources of the stroke in intra-abdominal pathology if we could find from the diagnosis. The sensitivity of the echocardiography has to, to, uh, method for the anal analyzing the infective endocarditis is around uh, 30 percent uh, uh, for prosthetic valves when we have uh, 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 transthoracal echocardiography but transesophageal echocardiography is around 95 to 100 percent roughly around uh, uh, 90 percent for the prosthetic valves very specific good for the bot examination Sources of echo uh, on error in echo interpretation, it's uh, mainly when we don't have the good uh, window for the um, good quality of imaging. Uh, valvular degeneration, which could uh, analyze the calcification, sclerosis, like vegetation, and other masses, masses like the papilloma, thrombus, myxomatosis, degeneration of the valve, uh, healed old vegetation, small sites of the uh, in, uh, vegetation and over zeros interpretation of the echo. Uh, when we look at about the patients with infective endocarditis when the transesophageal uh, echocardiography, this is the main that we could exclude to the diagnosis. This is the one of the highest sensitivity of the days when we have the symptoms of the fever. It's like the five to seven days of the beginning of the symptoms, but uh, if no other metastatic force of the antibiotic course will be around the 14 days of the examination. Transesophageal echocardiography must be repeated uh, on the end of the second week of the course of the antibiotic treatment prior to completing antibiotics. Uh, around 10 or 15 percent of the population, we don't have any development in, in uh, infect effective endocarditis. The, another group which is very uh, uh, not often uh, con conclusion with the uh, infective endocarditis 
this, this is the pregnant woman, uh, but the outcomes is very uh, difficult to uh, analyze it. And this is the one of the more maternal mobility and mortality with a high risk. Around uh, this could we could find this is the left side uh, engaged endocarditis and less on the right side. Uh, we could find the septotic pulmonary embolism, which is around the 20 to 25 percent of this uh, uh, in this group, and the central nerve system embolism is very often in the pregnant woman. The fatal outcomes uh, is uh, uh, with connected with the delivery and the survival about the discharge around the 50 percent of the in the woman with the endocarditis. Intrauterine demise is around 10 to 15 percent. Uh, echo predictors of the systemic embolism uh, with the patients with the endocarditis, it's uh, when we have the visible vegetation by the, both transthoracal and uh, uh, transesophageal echocardiography is more often. Uh, we could find the absence of the formation, high mobility vegetation. And especially when we have the vegetation sites more than 10 to 15 millimeters. Uh, vegetation more than 15 millimeters is very independent predictor of date. High mobile vegetation also with more than 15 millimeters is considered with the early surgical intervention in uh, uh, like the guidelines. Uh, we have the recurrent embolism, which is very persistent with the vegetation. Uh, it's uh, also uh, indication for the surgery. Mitral valve endocarditis, particularly on the arterial reflet, is very often, often for the systemic embolism and also be ventricular vegetation. We can see that uh, the sources with the vegetation sites uh, more than 15% 15 millimeters, it's with the high risk of the embolic heavens and uh, uh, very, when we have the more vegetation than one uh, leaflet or the one vegetation, there is also a high uh, severity of the risk of the uh, embolism. This is one of the study which is uh, Looking about the vegetation sites, it's included around uh, 150 patients with the endocarditis, uh, about the aortic on the mitral valve. The stroke occurred more often in the mitral valve endocarditis, it's around 33% than uh, aortic valve. Uh, independent predictor of the stroke, the study find that mitral valve vegeta vegetation length uh, more than seven millimeter is uh, with the high risk of the embolism. Uh, more predictors for the one uh, year mortality of, of the another study is around uh, uh, con conducted again with the vegetation length more than 15 millimeters, millimeters uh, the moderate of severe a chronic heart failure is around with the high risk of the uh, one year of the mortality. Uh, female sex also is uh, included with the uh, higher mortality on comorbidity more than two uh, index. It's also with the high risk for the mortality. Early surgery from the infective endocarditis with the large vegetation. It's another study which is published several years ago. They are looking about the uh, early sending of the uh, conventional treatment than the conventional treatment of the patient. When we look at about the high morbidity and mortality of these patients, you can see that the group which is uh, sending the early for the surgery uh, tend to uh, 20 days after the symptoms of the fever and the starting the treatment of the, the antibiotics. This group is with the uh, very uh, low uh, mortality next uh, 28 to 24 months. Uh, the composite of the embolism, the risk of the embolism is very low of the, in the group with the early surgery when we have this group with the uh, more than eight uh, embolism of the risk. So when we look at about the embolism, which is the very uh, often with the patients with the uh, infective endocarditis, we must consider 
early surgical treatment for the large vegetation, highly mobile vegetation, mitral valve localization, and controversial, with risk diminishes significantly over the time with antibiotics treatment. So like when we look at about the guidelines, which is published from the American guidelines from 2014, uh, the class 2A is, is uh, indication for the early surgery during the initial hospitalization before the completion of the full therapeutic course of the antibiotics is very reasonable for the patients with the infective endocarditis who present with the recurrent embolism and persistence of the vegetation despite the appropriated antibiotic theory. Uh, also, the class 2B is the early surgery with the greater uh, mobile vegetation than 10 millimeters in length with or without clinical evidence of the embolic phenomenon. This is the European guidelines uh, for the prevention embol embolism. When we have uh, uh, infective endocarditis of the outric or mitral valve with persistent uh, also the class 2B is the early surgery with the greater uh, mobile vegetation than 10 millimeters in length with or without clinical evidence of the embolic phenomenon. This is the European guidelines uh, for the prevention embol embolism. When we have uh, uh, infective endocarditis of the outric or mitral valve with persistent vegetation uh, more than 10 millimeters after one or more embolic episodes, despite the appropriate antibiotic therapy, we need organ uh, uh, cardiac surgery and valve replacement. This is the class 1B of the European guidelines. The timing of the surgery for endocarditis after the embolic cardiovascular uh, advance, it's, uh, we could find the embolic stroke uh, when we wait more than seven to 21 days, hemorrhagic stroke waiting for four weeks. Um, if he, we have the heat age, the, we can uh, think about the uh, mycotic aneurysm of the brain, avoid the valves that we need anticoagulation. So in 2007, the uh, next uh, appropriated focus at valve update uh, uh, guidelines looking about the uh, infective endocarditis, uh, and they spoke about operation without delay must be considered in patients with infective endocarditis and in indication for surgery who have suffered from the stroke but have no evidence of intracranial hemorrhagic and extensive neurological damages. If uh, we have hemodynamically stable, the link valve surgery is, uh, for more than four weeks may be considered among the patient with infective endocarditis and major ischemic stroke in or in the cranial hemorrhagic. Uh, complication uh, of endocarditis, which uh, will could be identified with echocardiography, uh, we could find very often the abscess of the valvular structures, aneurysm of intravalvular fibrosa, uh, and perforation of the uh, leaflets or it's the fistula, or the mechanical complication like the secondary to the leaflet destruction, and hemodynamical, most common cause of the deed is a regular lesion with the chronic heart failure. Uh, this is the one perivalvular infection phlegmon, which is, you can see from the aortic valve, here is the still moving, and here is this is the uh, looking how is looking with the vegetation and uh, this phlegmon, which is uh, patient was sent directly for the cardiac surgery. Uh, uh, Valve-related endocarditis is very incidental. Uh, median time from the implantation of the valve, this is around the five of the months. Uh, risk factors, uh, which we can find more from the young uh, people, male, and moderate to severe aortic regurgitation is very often. Uh, healthcare is associated with the uh, organism common with the Enterococcus staphylococcus aureus. Survival in the patient with the uh, aortic uh, valve 
of replacement transcarditis ulcerative aggregates and uh, endocarditis is uh, around 24 months when we find uh, and after the endocarditis and have the uh, normal treatment for the antibiotics. Right side in the uh, infective endocarditis is uh, associated uh, mainly with the uh, intravenous drug abuse of uh, unwilling uh, catheters or devices. We have the sepsis pulmonary embolism of a multifocal uh, cavitation. Uh, most, most often is uh, connected with the right heart failure, dysplasia of insertion, uh, uh, jugular venous uh, diminishes in lower extremely edema, and perivalvular extension or infection. It is increased with the uh, higher mortality, increased with the high risk of the embolic uh, incidence. This is one clinical case with the 26 uh, young men who is presented with the fever around uh, 38 degree, started three months after implanted pacemaker. He has the high level of the CRP and leukocytes, his latest staphylococcus aureus from the hemoculture. Uh, this is the transtoxic echo. Uh, the ejection fraction is actually normal, normal left ventricle function, normal right ventricle function, mild tricuspid regurgitation regarding the implanted uh, pacemaker. This is a transesophageal echocardiography of this patient, and we can look at about this uh, huge mass who is uh, connected to the uh, implanted uh, uh, device uh, on the right atrium of the huge vegetation. One month, uh, the patient was sent to cardiac surgery and one month after the uh, explanation of the, the uh, pacemaker and uh, electrodes, this is the post-surgery uh, and Two minutes left. Excuse me, ma'am. Yes. Two minutes left. So please wrapping yes. your uh, presentation, please. Yes. Uh, this is one small mass that is uh, without any fever signs from the endocarditis. But after one month, the patient has started with the, another fever and we sent again for the cardiac surgery. This is the new vegetation. Uh, echocardiography protocol for the right-sided structures. So this is unusual that we could find some of the uh, unspecific mass, which is uh, uh, have to see on the right atrium or the right ventricle. Specific morphology aspect of the right side in endocarditis uh, uh, actually is uh, located from the tricuspid valve, or stachian valve, or pulmonary valves to the cardiac devices also, and uh, even to the right atrial valve can be on the site of the vegetation. Also, as the conclusion of this. Uh, uh, my first part, which is the previous comment of the extent literature of mind, we can put forward the uh, following recommendation regarding the echocardiography compared of approach on the patient suspecting that they having uh, uh, endocarditis. Echocardiography findings must be assessed with the clinical context. Transesophageal and trans is very mandatory in the patient with the implanted cardiac devices or to, uh, uh, to diagnose the patients with the endocarditis, then we have this uh, uh, diagnosis is lacking. The Bayesian based approach should be guided by the decision-making process in the context. As the summary, echo and endocarditis, uh, when we have suspected endocarditis clinically, Transthoracic echo is the main that we could perform, but for the diagnosis of the vegetation, the transesophageal echocardiography is mainly for this patient. So the masses we can find in the our uh, the, on the ventricle. This is the left ventricle thrombus. Very incidence in the current era of the era of the acute myocardial infarction. We can find five to fifteen percent thrombicult occur in the early 24 hours after the acute myocardial infarction. Here is one the, uh, uh, anterior myocardial infarction with hypokinesic uh, apex of the left ventricle and one huge thrombus here, which is located for the zone of the ischemia. And this is the very unusual. This is the thrombus on the right atrium. 
which is with a high risk again for the pulmonary embolism and systemic embolism. Uh, the thrombus of the left atrial appendage is very common, especially with the patients who is with the uh, arterial fibrillation. Transesophageal echocardiography is modality of the choice for the evaluate the left atrial anatomy and function and meta-analysis of the many of the patients that could be find this, this is the high risk of the um, cardiac embolism. Uh, primary cardiac tumors is very rare, less, less than 1%. They have the high risk of the potential of the um, embolic potential. We could find myxoma, papillary fibroelostoma. I'm sorry, that is not moving here, the video. Uh, papillary fibroelostoma is uh, strongly associated with the left side mobile per, uh, PFIO and the stalk with the future embolic phenomenon. Transesophageal echocardiography is mon most accurate to characterize this modality. As uh, last my slide, that take home message, one echocardiographic modality doesn't fit for all these diagnoses. So the transesophageal um, echocardiography uh, and other modalities is very useful when we look at about the patients with the endocarditis over the left ventricles or right ventricle masses. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your very informative presentation. Actually, I'd like to congratulate all our learned and respected speakers for their brilliant and informative presentation. Now, our question answer session, actually, there is a no question in our chat box. Uh, because of time constraint, uh, I would like to any of our panelists uh, to give uh, remarks, a uh, few words regarding the session or ask uh, any question if they have any question. Anybody from panel can I, can I give some comment? No. Uh, thank you, all the faculties uh, um, and uh, all the foreign faculties and uh, national faculties. Uh, I am uh, grateful uh, to all of you, as I am a, a secretary of International Affairs of Bangladesh Society of Echocardiography. I congratulate all for um, all of you uh, from BSc. And thank you for your time and effort. Thank you very much. Now, I would like to request our convener, BTECO 2020, uh, Professor Shatil Banerjee sir, uh, to give uh, remarks uh, regarding the prize giving ceremony. Shatil Banerjee sir, please. Am I audible? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. Yes. Thank you. Uh, it is my great privilege uh, to announce uh, that the session three in the morning half, there was an interesting eco presentation. Uh, cases, we are supposed to declare the name of the award winner. The jury board has selected three panelists, three presenters for award and our President, Professor M. Nazrul Islam Saad. The, uh, he will uh, announce the name of the winners. I request uh, Professor M. Nazrul Islam Saad to uh, announce the name of the winners. Uh, thank you, Professor Shazal. Uh, before that, I like to thank all the presenters of the last session uh, and all of from the Europe and other country, including uh, uh, <clears throat> Shaukat, I like to thank you all because uh, you have uh, taken so much trouble, uh, possibly for the odd time in your office time, uh, joining this uh, scientific session. However, uh, regarding the award-winning uh, presentation of ECHO cases from the national faculties, there, there were nine uh, uh, presenters and uh, possibly everybody has presented this very nicely and with very effective way they have presented it. And uh, I think the jury has uh, got a tremendous uh, uh, thinking over the matter to select uh, the first three out of this. Uh, but I myself consider everybody, everybody has got uh, uh, done their best of this thing. 
So, in the natural way, I'm, I'm going to announce the name, uh, one, two, three. Uh, his presenter number one is, means first, is uh, Dr. Govindo. Presenter two, second, is Dr. Naharuma. And presenter three, third, Dr. Chayong. So thank you, uh, the out winner, three out winner of, of this presentation. Thank you very much. And uh, Professor, Professor Shajal, I think we can go to the closing ceremony. Right. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, Gulam Ajam, Ajam, Professor Ajam, are you with us? I think he's uh, with us. No? Yes, no, sir. sir Yes, sir. Yes. You can start the concluding session. Thank you very much, sir. Um, it's my really honor and privilege to say something in closing remarks session. As you know, in our Bangladesh Society of Ecography organized this wonderful virtual summit and that give us a tremendous input and give a unique opportunity to learn a lot from the interaction between all national and international faculties. Actually, this virtual summit give us many of the key aspects of echocardiography. As you know, I must give a special thanks to organizers, especially the scientific committee, who wonderfully designed this scientific content which is very much useful in our daily practice. And we believe everybody will learn from the every session. No session is unimportant. Every session is important and everyone will learn from every session. And we have really a unique experience in digitally and we learn from our interaction and our young colleague they tremendously perform their presentations and our especially scientific convener, Professor Shalomishtu Benerji sir and our, our Secretary General, Professor Eka Pudurovan and our President, Professor Nazul Islam sir and with his team, really worked hard and without their support, we believe this program cannot be succeeded. So at the whole day we are enjoying this session. I believe everyone is exhausted, but this program, I just now I feel it like a small story. So uh, really we feel happy and despite our national and international faculty have their, there are some limitation as because of their workplace is also they are now still working and today our holiday, but uh, at the end of the day, we organize our program and we believe it will be more insightful program. And in future, we look for future opportunities with other collaboration and we arrange such a wonderful program to promote our cardiologists and interact their knowledge with our national and international faculties. At the end of the session, now I'm requesting Professor Shadul Krishna Banerjee sir to give his concluding remarks. Then finally, uh, conclusion is declared by our president, Professor M. Nozul Iskaptar. Firstly, I request Professor Shadul Krishna Banerjee sir to give his conclusion remarks. Thank you, Professor Ajam. Uh, this 13th, 30th, 13th November is a great, unique day for us. Bangladesh Society of Ego Cardiography will remain it in a very special manner because in this pandemic situation, this scientific semi summit was arranged on a virtual uh, manner. When I came to know that I will be the convener of this summit, it was really a challenge and a great headache for me that how I will finish everything. But one thing I must tell that the international speakers, they have responded so promptly and so 
or nicely that our one male is good enough to be here for this day long session. So I must express my heartfelt gratitude to all the international faculties for their great effort and their troublesome issue to manage time, particularly to the trouble to adjust the time with Bangladesh. The American, the British, the European people, they have managed time with the time of Bangladesh. So I must give heartfelt thanks to all the international faculties. And we are really benefited by the talk they have given and we'll remain ever grateful to them. And we wish them thanks and grat gratefulness. And I, I must express my gratitude and sympathy uh, and sincere thanks to the President of the Bangladesh Society of Eco Cardiography, Professor M. Nazrul Islam, General Secretary, Professor Fazlur Rahman, uh, the Secretary of International Affairs, Dr. Nilifar Fatima, Scientific Affairs, Dr. Golam Ajam, Professor Golam Ajam, and other members of the executive committee and also the well wishers in the field of non-invasive and interventional cardiologists. And if they don't give me the support, it was really a tough job for me to finish the day long program. I must again thank, give, give them thanks and express my gratitude to all of them. And last of all, I will give thanks and uh, definitely special thanks to Beximco Pharmaceutical for the day long service they have given to connect everyone from the different corners of the world to this international summit. So at the end of the summit, you the attendees, you the participants, you will judge where we stay, where we stand. Whether the conference is a successful one or not, it is your judgment. But we have tried our best to make this, this conference a unique one, particularly considering academic ground. So I wish all attendees, all participants, my heartfelt thanks and gratitude. And thanks to Almighty to finish the day without any interruption without any problem. So thank you again. Remain safe and healthy in this pandemic era. Now I will request my mentor and the president of Bangladesh Society of Eco Cardiography, Professor M. Nazrul Islam Sar, to conclude the session and he will pass the concluding remarks. Thank you all. Sir, uh, sir, can I uh, add one point, sir? Thank sir, you. with the permission of our president. Uh, before our president, Professor M. Nozul Islam, sir, is the dreamer and doer in echocardiography in Bangladesh. So, so I, am, I will be happy uh, be, before going to his final conclusion remarks, our Secretary General, if he is available, uh, he can 
give a brief overview or brief comment for this conclusion remarks. Professor Fuzdurahman, sir, if you are available, sir, that you can give a brief comment, then we we'll go for final comment for our president from our president. Now the student will be over with you. Assalamualaikum. <coughs> Excellent, very weak. I think my president will make a very valuable comment. And this is enough. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fuzdurahman, sir. Uh, we wish you will be uh, you will be happy and you will be in good health within very very few days and now i am requesting our president professor m nozul islam sir all of you know he is the first man who introduced echocardiography in bangladesh in practically so i am requesting professor m nozul islam sir please give your valuable opinion and conclude the session sir nozul islam sir assalamu alaikum Actually, this is now my, my turn to close the session officially. But uh, before uh, giving uh, my comment, uh, I ask everybody, everybody who are listening to us and who has uh, attended this program, to so please pray for uh, uh, Professor, especially Professor Fuzlu and all other doctors who are suffering from uh, this disease. And uh, actually, the programs. Vital prime mover is uh, uh, Professor Fazlur Rahman, and I'm really uh, with uh, with a very hard uh, mind, uh, just requesting all of you to please pray for him for his early recovery, uh, so that he can come to the, our our uh, work with the same enthusiasm. Uh, actually, I do not have to say much. Much of this thing has been had been told by uh, Professor Azam and Shahzal Banerjee. And I actually strongly, I strongly uh, congratulate the team, though closely work for the uh, for successful, uh, 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 successful of uh, of this particular program. And all the foreign faculties are still in the morning. Uh, we are really grateful because this will help with the cardiologist in, in different level and especially for the residents and the fellows in training, uh, we have to have grow with uh, their future uh, professional development uh, should be encouraged by these sort of things. In fact, all of the people who work for this uh, successful uh, uh, development of this program, they actually made the unlucky 13, in fact, to a lucky 13 day of the November. And I congratulate everybody from both, all from uh, homes and abroad. I would like to thank you all. And with this, I like to officially conclude today's program, day long program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you, sir. God bless you. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank, you. thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Had a long day. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Uh, Hello, Fabiola. How are you, Fabiola? Nice to see you. Thank you. Nice Hello.